You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million on my head. I'm a better player than a robot. Just win. I don't want to get a million dollars. The devil that's it. And I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the sixth part of What If Deku Finds Danny Phantom in MHA. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of Ruse Emp on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. During the following weeks every student was giving it their all. Every approach was different, but at the core everyone aimed to perfect their quirks as much as they could, given the time limit. Danny himself took all the time he could to practice. The school had granted the students as much time as possible, allowing them to train during the second half of the day. The Hafa appreciated it, and the rest of students, too, he was certain of it. However, Phantom wondered about having such chance at all. Come to think of it, between school, his family's shenanigans and nigh-constant ghost attacks, he rarely got a chance for a simpler, calm training. It was the reason his powers were so many and yet so. Surface level, he adapted, but never polished them enough to call one of them his crown jewel, his prime power. Each ghost he fought had their main sh tick, be it the wish granting of one particular nosy genie, or the sword that made all foes perish into the realm of deepest fears. Phantom had none of that. It was his strength, but also his weakness. Maybe it was the direction he should have taken. What point was there in neglecting other abilities in favor of one? His arsenal made him unpredictable, unlike his enemies. He knew Desiree was helpless against the wishes made against her or a simple shut mouth. Fright was someone to keep distance from. Their actions all spun around utilizing their key power, which made them easy to read. It was the key factor behind Danny learning to fight them with little damage to himself. Thus, it was probably good for him. Aizawa seemed to be in favor of such decision as well. In your case, it will be better to learn a thousand weapons rather than master one a thousand times. He told the Hafa, your time is limited, even when the festival is over. You cannot physically master them all in a lifetime, because there is always room for improvement. The teacher would then go on to clarify that mastering did not necessarily equal simple polishing meaning that Danny could still expand on them, creating tactics and combinations that would catch an enemy unprepared. It was a solid advice, the one Phantom, admittedly, hadn't sought himself. It was through Aizawa's own dedication to his work that Danny was given such advice in the first place. Call it his latent arrogance, but he still had little belief that the people with a single quirk could bring something new to the table. It turned out he was wrong, and it was probably for the better for him. Danny followed the advice, coming up with certain combos that could leave his enemies in the dust, even those that awaited him upon the return home. The very thought of shock on Plasmius's face filled his ice heart with joy. Eventually, in what appeared to the students like no time at all, the day of the festival came about. To the guests of the school, who had to endure rigorous examinations and bag inspections, it was nonetheless an event long expected. The UA, itself, despite its extra attention to security, was still trying to be as welcoming and accommodating as possible. Some would call it a shameless attempt to sweep the villain incident under the rug, and also earn some cash in the process, but it was far from truth. The school certainly earned some benefits from its position as a first-class institution, but they could hardly be denied the actual agency in all this, one that has already been mentioned. Nonetheless, as the guests were strolling from one stand to another, cozying themselves before the start of the actual event, the students were busy changing into their gym uniforms back in the dressing rooms. Awa, Mina moaned. I wanted to wear my costume. It's to keep everything fair, responded Ajiro. Why is it th fat big of a deal? Danny said through his takoyaki stuffed mouth, before gulping. The suits just expand our abilities. Everyone here has a suit. It's already fair. For someone it is even more hampering, he pointed at surprised Yeyorazu. The gym uniform exposed less skin, and limited her options. Yes, we are being robbed of a treasure, Minta mumbled, making it explicit that he wasn't talking about abilities. Hiroshima finished chewing the portion his friend had brought for him and grinned. We can still kick ass, it's not that big of a problem. Where did you two even get takoyaki? Mind to wind and reached for the box. I may have sneaked out to get some, Danny said, looking away, but still slapping Minta's small greedy hand. They actually have a lot of stuff out there. Might want to check those stands after the first round. By the way, where is everyone? Ida burst through the door. It is finally the time. Leave it to the deputy to scout ahead, Danny smirked. 
Ida had really wanted to keep watch and alert everyone, and who was he to stop him? Danny got up from his seat, but then he saw where everyone was looking. Todoroki and Midoriya seemed to be having a conversation. Looking at things objectively, I think I am stronger than you, the former spoke, making the half a freeze. How come that green-haired kid made rivals without him even noticing? Midoriya hesitantly and shyly agreed with his classmate. Todoroki took it as a clue to continue. But, All Might has his eyes on you, doesn't he? I'm not trying to pry, but I'm going to beat you. Oh, is that one of the tops declaring a war? Kaminari said with excitement. Danny and Kirishima seemed to have caught on on how the situation was escalating and also acted upon it. The latter even took hold of Todoroki's shoulder. Hey, hey, why are you picking a fight all of a sudden? The redhead asked as Danny stood between the two. Right before the start, too, the Hafa added, putting a hand on his belt. We are not here to play at being friends, Todoroki shook off Kirishima. So what does it matter? He asked and turned to walk away. Ancients, you too. Danny groaned. Was my stupid speech all for nothing? He said and looked at the bewildered Midoriya. Why him of all people, the Hafa wondered. But before he could ask Todoroki, the green-haired boy chose to talk back on his own. Todoroki-san. I don't know what you're thinking when you say you will beat me dot 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 and probably you will, because you are more capable than most people. Hey, Midoriya, Kirishima laughed nervously. You probably shouldn't talk so negatively. But, everyone is trying so hard, the boy's fists shook. And you can be sure I'll be giving it all of my own, too. Danny blinked in surprise, as the boy's determined face made him think and ponder of most unexpected things. Very well, was Todoroki's brief response before he left the room. The rest of the students followed suit, and the one behind was, surprisingly, the half-ghost himself. Mina was the one to notice this, slowing down her speed and waving her pink palm in front of the class rep's thoughtful face. Earth to Danny, come in, she said, snapping the half out of his musings. Oh, right, he mumbled. I'm going. Was Midoriya's speech so inspiring? The girl joked, thought-provoking, more like, I just realized that I don't have much agency in this stuff. What do you mean? Asked Mina in surprise. I mean, you don't have whatever is going on between Midoriya-kun and Todoroki-kun. But we all are here for a purpose, right? We want every agent out there to see us. Yeah. But then again, who was there to tell him if his future lied with the local heroes? If his license, his internship would mean anything at all. He may have acted cocky and arrogant as usual, confident in his abilities, but his temporary aims were shed some light on, and it didn't make them appear any prettier. Petty, more like... For when compared to the aspirations of the unlucky students, to the sudden rivalry between two of his classmates, coupled with probably another two back Hugo had mentioned long before the tournament, Danny's own goals appeared so insignificant. To gain an internship for a job that he might not even get or want, to simply show everyone who was the strongest. It made a sense of guilt emerge in his stomach. He was going to try reaching for his petty goals, ruining the greater ones in the process. It was nothing an outsider to that world. A stranger who played by his own rules and imposed them on others should be proud of. Nonetheless, the half a bore with that nasty, knowing feeling. He had never been ashamed of his ghost powers. He wasn't about to start. Meanwhile, the whole stadium was roaring happily upon seeing present Mike in the flesh. Or, well, through the giant screen. But he was there, in his own room just nearby. Pay attention, audience, swarm, mass media. This year's high school rodeo of adolescence that you all love, the UA. Sports festival is about to begin. He yelled excitedly, everybody, are you ready? And this time, his joy and anticipation were reciprocated by the crowd, which happily bellowed their eager response. It's time for the students to enter the first year stage. And as the students began to emerge from the corridors, present Mike continued to speak over the noises of the fireworks and the shouting crowds, his voice resonating across the entire arena the size of several football fields and the height to boot. And here they are, the miraculous new stars who overcame enemy attacks with their hearts of steel. Hero Course, Class 1A. And the students in the spotlight each reacted differently. Th, there are so many people, Midoriya said through cluttering teeth. You aren't taking it the worst, Ida mumbled and pointed at the class rep whose feigned smile and mechanical waves of his hand could not fool anyone who saw his wobbly feet. They wouldn't have noticed it, believing the class rep to be the most confident of all, but his outburst after the tense talk to the students made them notice such subtle details. I wonder if we can give our best performance being watched by so many. He's going a bit overboard with praises, huh, Fenton? Kirishima asked his friend. Yeah, Danny said through the clenched teeth of his smile. What say you, Bakugo? Kirishima continued. This gets me just in the mood, Bakugo grinned maliciously. Present Mike continued introducing all the classes that would be participating. Not only the hero course took part, as was to be expected. 
There were the general studies, the support classes, from which Danny could easily make out Hatsune's figure, and several others. The students all gathered in front of a podium, on which stood the hero Midnight. Time for the player pledge, she exclaimed, representing the students as Fenton Daniel, Class 1A. The half looked ready to faint. Nobody had told him that part. The gazes he caught from some of the students, who had never agreed to be represented by him, only aggravated his anxiety. But of course they would chose the exam's top score. But it still came off a surprise and a cruel joke at his expense. Danny made a deep sigh, trying to overcome the grip on his core. The half a slowly made his way to the scene as Midnight stepped away from the mic. Phantom approached the microphone, gulped, and began to speak. Aim, well, that's a bit embarrassing. He laughed nervously, rubbing the back of his neck. The echo of his resonating voice startling even him. An uncomfortable pause settled afterwards. He had to say something. A nice day for a festival, isn't it? His classmates felt a sense of dread overcome them. Fenton was a very poor choice for a public speaker. That Hugo, however, guffawed at the half his discomfort. The audience, in the meantime, was left to wonder who that nervous wreck is and why in the world was someone like him representing the students of the World Class Hero Academy. Midnight hissed quietly. Perhaps it really was mistake. Come on, Fenton. Do what you always do, he told himself. Pretend they are not even there. Right? The pledge, the teen coughed. He wanted to crack a joke at the tardiness of the teachers that put him in such a position, to ease his anxiety as always, but he had a feeling it would not be appreciated by anyone. He was all on his own this time round. I pledge on behalf of every student present here aim that the competition today will be a testament to our willpower, first and foremost. He said the first thing that came to mind. And now he had to finish the thought, speaking to the silent audience. It is the will to rise higher, beyond what even we expect of ourselves. Boom. Because ultimately, as long as everyone is pushing themselves past the expected limitations, it means that there is nothing that can stop us. The sudden upturn in his speech made his friends eagerly support him with cheers, and some from the audience joined in. It put Danny's mind at ease somewhat. Yes, the entire world was watching them, but those millions of eyes he did not see. What mattered was the reaction of those who were currently at the arena. The newly gained boost in confidence allowed him some breathing space to go beyond. That's our school's motto, the one we intend to follow till the end, he exclaimed and opened his arms wide. And at that the audience and a part of the students began to loudly cheer even at a somewhat generic and half the time insecure speech. Midnight flashed him a small smile and gestured for the class rep to return to his classmates, who greeted him cordially, noting the wobbly legs again. How their confident crisis leader and strongest fighter was reduced to mush each time he was put into such situation was beyond them. Those were situations where he could not jest and jab someone. Those were actually the people who could dislike him and whose opinion mattered to him, too. But those were not the thoughts present in everyone's heads. Meanwhile, one particular indigo-haired student was closely observing the half-ghost, wondering what behavior was his true one. The one he had displayed before his fellow students or the whole world. Could his insecurities be but a facade to hide how dangerous he actually was or was it something else? But he too had to divert his attention elsewhere. The one who were watching with great interest were certain viewers. Two of them were sitting right with the rest of the audience. The small Tsukachi family, with its only two members, were up there, both a bit concerned for the teen under the detective's care being thrust into something like that. Still, they knew that it wasn't all that important and that the thing that actually mattered were the end results and prowess. Makoto had even convinced her boss, who also did everything she said, to come along and watch. Captain Celebrity had had to protest, but there was little he could do. Even if the perspective of hiring a promising countryman was somewhat appealing, the other viewer, however, unknowingly shared their opinion. From his secure location, the kingpin of the Japanese crime world was also watching with great interest. And while he was far from impressed by the display, he knew he had to keep his expectations high enough. Even if the boy was his son, he couldn't inherit the perfect ability of speech. Or, in line with Fenton's schoolmate's suspicion, all for one did not exactly disperse the notion of the facade either. It could be a trick worthy of his potential offspring. Nonetheless, Midnight resumed her position near the mic as the screens above blared first round. Now, let's get started right away. She spoke. The first game is what you'd call a qualifier. Every year, many students drink their tears here. Now, here is the fateful first game. As the obscenely dressed woman said it, a holographic screen emerged, with the images on it flashing akin to a slot machine. 
and then it stopped, and everyone could read the words Obstacle Race. The name was pretty self-explanatory, but Midnight still explained certain details. The students were told to gather near one of the exits, ready to run outside when all three of the lights were out. They were permitted to use their quirks however they desired, as long as those were not used to cheat and cut the distance. Nobody told them, however, what the obstacle course entailed. As the teens were gathering, Danny was unexpectedly caught by one particular redhead. Feeling a light nudge, the half a turned to face grinning Kendo. Didn't take you for someone with a stage fright, Fenton San, she smirked. Yeah, yeah, laugh at my misery, Danny mumbled, wiping his mouth. I hope it didn't make you lose your guard. Don't take me for an idiot, pal, Kendo put a hand on her belt. I remember the entrance exam. Danny smiled. I assure you, I haven't lost any of the skills. Are you even allowed to switch into your robot slayer mode? Ro dot 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 oh dot 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 well, nobody said anything against my ghost form. Then again, they didn't say anything about the stupid pledge, the half a grumbled. The redhead laughed. Well, I'm gonna go join the others. They are already giving you angry looks. They dot 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 they aren't jealous of our attention, are they? As the redhead walked away, she waved at him. They certainly are. Great, so not even his ingenious negotiation didn't have much of an impact. Danny sighed and started readying for the race. No point in dwelling on that at that time. Everyone got ready, theirs and everyone else's eyes drawn to three small green lamps, as they slowly shut down, one by one. The Hafa took a deep breath. After that display, he had no choice but to show everyone why he was number one. Start. Midnight bellowed and unleashed all hell. The crowd rushed through the corridor that lead towards the outside, while present Mike excitedly continued the narration. Alright, here's the play-by-play. -play. Are you ready to do the commentary, doom and gloom? He turned towards Aizawa, who looked less than pleased to be there. You're the one who forced me to come, he responded. Alright, my friend, what should the students pay attention to in the early stages? This part, what he addressed was something most students came to realize pretty soon. The corridor was way too narrow to fit them all, and thus a big congestion came to be. The students pushed each other around, threatening to stomp on the smaller ones. The competition had already started. Danny assessed the situation. He was far from the other end, but luckily he had several ways of getting through. The half a leaped into the air and over everyone's heads, flying forward towards the exit as fast as his human form could. But then, from the spot further ahead, a blizzard emerged, devouring everything in its path. At the last second, Danny conjured a portal and dived inside of it, emerging outside and landing on the ice-covered surface. Thankfully, five meters sufficed. A brief look back surprised the Hafa, for his Todoroki pushed ahead. Being the obvious perpetrator, the corridor was frozen, covered in ice, with the other unfortunate contestants being stuck. Ruthless, but he nonetheless secured his lead. But not for long. Danny grinned, switched into his ghost form, which at the time also entailed a P. Uniform simply switching to black and white instead of a full change and flew forward. Behind him, several other students made it through, either being able to avoid Todoroki's trap, or get themselves out of it. While Kirishima and several others were making it further, Danny's attention was on two most probable contestants, the cold-hearted Half and Half and hot-headed Bakugo, who propelled himself in the air with his explosions. The half his neon green eyes peered into Todoroki, and the human boy saw how close the half ghost was. You cheeky dick waffle, the half a grinned. You ain't seen nothing yet. Charging a blast in his palm. With there being no rule against sabotage, Danny fired a blast further ahead of them all. He surprised Todoroki, who was fully prepared to meet the shot, and the beam of ectoplasm exploded, launching upwards tons of dirt. With a laugh and a last wave, the half a flipped in the air and phased right through the improvised wall, while the rest had to wait for the dirt and substratum rocks to fall back down, lest they remain buried under. He is quite good, said Makoto, who, just like everyone else, was watching the screens. Quick on his feet, inventive, too. Don't you agree, Captain? WH dot 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 wa. Captain Celebrity seemed to have snapped out of his thoughts. Which one are watching out for again? He shrunk under his manager's burning look. Tsukachi smiled at the exchange and chuckled. Keep going, Danny. I know you can win this, he thought. The Hafa, enjoying the temporary advantage, flew forward. But then, at the last second, he had to dodge something mid-air. A green piece of metal, a hand, to be precise. Phantom's eyes were ready to bulge out when he realized the next challenge that awaited the students. Ooh, seems like the obstacles have shown up suddenly. Present Mike announced, starting with the Robo Inferno, the faux villains. Of course the school would not take out such sophisticated machinery only once per year. But it was not what shocked the half-ghost the most, no just that simple fact. 
The problem was an army of zero pointers, the same gargantuan, building sized machines. Deciding to up your game, huh? The Hafa asked nobody in particular, floating at a distance. Last time he had used his whale, but it would be foolish to use it so early, when there were other trials in the way. He had never actually tested how well they fared against the much more crude use of power. However, even the brief delay was enough for Todoroki to make it thus far. Then, a metaphorical light bulb lit up over the half-ghost's stark-haired head. Looking at the nearest colossus, Danny flew towards him, showing no intention of stopping. Todoroki, just as the people who had seen him phase through objects, expected him to do just that. However, the boy did not emerge from the other side, not that his competitors could see it. Todoroki did not waste time on the empty observations, readying his ice power. He let out everything at once, and the ice blizzard enveloped the machines in their entireties. The team did not waste time, running between the legs of the nearest frozen robot. He stopped them. We can get through. The shouts from the eager students were heard. I wouldn't recommend it. Todoroki responded as he ran. I froze them when they were unbalanced. And as he was saying this, the ice began to crack, unable to hold so many tons of metal for long. Several machines began to fall, unable to process what was happening quick enough, creating just an obstacle Todoroki had sought. Todoroki from Class 1A. Present Mike said excitedly. He attacked and defended in one hit. How elegant. Amazing. He's the first one through. It's, you know, practically unfair. His moves are logical and strategic. But he wasn't the first one. Where is Fenton? Eh? In the meantime, one machine stood, its head turned towards the running ice wielder. To the shock of many, the robot suddenly grabbed one of its hands, tore it out and threw it further ahead. Todoroki saw it, and came to a halt, as the gigantic piece of metal fell right in front of him. Furthermore, it was focused solely on him. Something isn't right, present Mike commented. Self-mutilation and such priorities aren't a part of the robot's programming. Could it be? The machine moved after Todoroki, its speed exceeding the boys. He had no choice but to face it, with his path forward blocked off. Todoroki launched even more ice, but the momentum was so great that the ice only slowed down and made the robot tilt forward. Now the prodigious student had to avoid the falling construct, sliding across the ice to the side. And then, with the corner of his eye, he saw how the half a burst out from the robot's head, laughing in his usual manner, loud and clear, landing on the ground at the other end of the open area. He was once again ahead of everyone, giving a taunting salute. See you at the finish line, he shouted and flew forward. Todoroki was about to pursue, but then he had to dodge a small spike projectile that came from one of the students. Yes, he should have seen that coming. Could it be? Present Mike asked. Fenton, the class rep of Class 1A, took over the robot and turned it against his main competition. Now Todoroki is locked with the students out for his blood for what he did before. This guy is a top student for a reason, everybody. Aizawa nodded. He is being inventive, but he is not moving at his full speed. He narrowed his eyes. Heh, for every rabbit there is a turtle. Present Mike smirked. I guess we shall see. The audience was left shocked upon learning of the anxious teen's achievements, allowing the rumors to spread. It was like they were now watching a different person altogether. Fenton was already displaying several seemingly unrelated powers, and now the whole world was witnessing his prowess. Who's that guy even? Asked a random Joe from the audience. His quirk is a very unique and strong combination. With proper judgment, he can avoid any danger. That tournament was the grand statement to the globe that announced the half-ghost's presence, for better or worse. So far he was only known to the select few, but that was going to change. Danny's mind had not pondered on that much, nor was he wondering about it as he traversed the currently empty road. The pathos was lost on him as he flew forward, close to the ground. Well, the first obstacle has been a piece of cake, huh? Asked present Mike. But what say you about the next one? Danny's hearing could catch the voice hero's words. So, they made it through the robots, quicker than he had hoped. He was already seeing the others round the corner. But the sight ahead made the half a blink with his toxic green eyes. It was a long artificial ravine, with several pillars sticking from the ground and connected with steel ropes obviously meant for traversing. Danny looked down, and he saw no bottom of that black pit. How did they make it in such short time? The half a shrugged and flew over it. Right? We should have seen that one, present Mike grumbled. However, Danny's flight was not that simple. He heard a loud yell behind, and from above came the particular blonde who hit him dead on. That Hugo's explosions had been drowned out by the shouting crowds at the stadium, and that allowed the human teen to get close and elbow the half a hard. Both of them hit the edge of the pillar, and each grabbed on the protruding pieces of rock. Ha, huh? watch your surroundings, dumbass. Beck Hugo barked a laugh. I'm not the one dropping on people, number two, Danny smirked. 
The blonde's palm cracked like a petard as his expression contorted into that of rage. Stop calling me that, spook, he exclaimed and fired. The explosion hit the spot where Phantom had been, but the Hafa pushed himself away at the last second, summoning a shield to defend against the rocks and dust. Hearing the sound above, the Hafa looked up and saw Todoroki sliding across the rope, freezing it. If he kept the speed, he would not trip, Danny realized. It was also clear that Danny had lost the lead. No, nah, the name suits you, Danny said and grinned, before flying upwards and landing on top of the pillar. Immediately he heard the explosions below, as Bakugo jumped off the cliff as well, following right after him. Phantom had no time for that, as Todoroki was getting well ahead of them. So, Danny turned towards the blonde, hiding his fog-engulfed palm behind his back. And just before his face made a contact with the human teen's fist, a portal appeared between them, where Bakugo flew in effortlessly, emerging five meters away and facing a different direction, all the while keeping the inertia he had before. That made some distance between them, enough for the Hafa to continue flying forward, over the ravine, over the rest of the competition. He knew Bakugo could not fire explosions at a large distance, so as long as the explosion wielder was kept far away, he was at the advantage. This was not a fight, they were just wasting each other's time. In no time he already made it to the end of the second challenge, with Todoroki still being slightly ahead. Very soon Danny came to realize why the ice wielder slowed down, and stopped to process what was happening all on his own. The giant signs that read, danger, mines, were a clear indication of what they were dealing with. And just so nobody had any doubts, present Mike was there with an explanation. Now, we've quickly arrived at the final barrier. The deal here is that it is a minefield. It's set up specifically so that you can clearly see where the mines are. For a moment, Danny was struck with disbelief that something so potentially lethal was being used. And being buried under a thinner layer of dirt was a weak consolation. By the way, these mines are for games, so they are much less powerful. Present Mike answered an unspoken question that was on everyone's mind. But they are loud and flashy enough to make you wet your pants. That depends on the person, Aizawa added. Danny was fairly happy and somewhat disappointed that all of those challenges were mitigated by the ability to fly. Same deal there, because as Todoroki tried to tiptoe around the mines, the half a flew by him, as the mines on the ground could not be triggered by someone off the ground. That much was obvious. However, the human teen had anticipated that. Luckily Danny hadn't taken it too far away from the ground. Concentrating the ice power in his hands, Todoroki fired forward, beneath the half-ghost. The mine was triggered by the blizzard and ice as it detonated into pinkish smoke. Phantom felt how the powerful force underneath pushed him away as he yelped from surprise. Danny managed to turn intangible and kill the momentum at the expense of his spine. If he had one, the half-ghost turned towards Todoroki as the former's eyes glowed menacingly. Wrong choice, he said, and then he fired a blast, responding in kind to Todoroki's plan. The ice wielder had expected that and turned forward. The subsequent explosion only propelled him forward, much to Danny's surprise and frustration. The human teen outstretched his hands and landed with grace with his face centimeters above another mine. Todoroki pushed himself back to his feet and continued to tiptoe around the mines as the half of floated behind. Would you look at that? Todoroki managed to turn the obstacle into boost. A risky move, but the one that paid off. Phantom could see that his opponent was trying to dissuade him from trying that stunt again. He basically proclaimed that rigging the mines was only going to aid him. Danny decided to play it safer. He pushed himself into the sky. Danny got high enough to be immune to the mines, but yet another source of explosions never was that far behind, as always foretelling his approach with a series of booming noises and his own yells. This shit doesn't affect me, he exclaimed, deciding to pick a fight with someone whom he hated more than the rest. The Hafa turned towards the incoming threat. He met Bakugo with a swing of his hand, but the blonde managed to lower his head and dodge. The next moment Bakugo fired a point-blank shot and pushed himself away. Phantom turned intangible at the last second, and the explosion was rendered null. He decided to not get stuck in another fight, and flew forward. Bakugo was pissed, and he obviously was not going to give up. The blonde flew right after the half-ghost, but he could not deny the obvious. If Phantom never stopped or Bakugo kept the current pace, the latter would not be able to catch up with him. That spook was moving too quickly. Todoroki knew he couldn't reach the two, and could only tiptoe quicker and riskier hoping that the two lead contestants were going to get tangled in a fight. He was not wrong, because Bakugo decided to go full throttle in order to catch up with the rest. His eyes on the target, he went after half a still. Danny had been attentive of the blonde's movements this time around, so he flipped in the air, 
and face the teen once more. He expected Bakugo to unleash another point-blank explosion, hoping that the Hafa would not go intangible in time. An explosion took place, but even before the smoke could clear, Bakugo felt something wrap around his leg. He immediately was flipped over and suspended in the air. As the smoke cleared, he and every viewer could see that Phantom was grinning widely. Instead of his legs there was a wispy, ghostly tail that held Bakugo in place. This ain't a fight, number two. Concentrate on what you have a chance of winning. Bakugo was a perfect target for his constant teasing. So easy to set off, he easily lost his cool and made missteps Phantom could exploit. And since the tournament was far from over, it could just come in handy later. That's what the half-ghost believed and what his main combat strategy was. Before the furious blonde could create another explosion, Phantom's tail flicked and tossed the explosive menace far away. Despite sticking the landing, albeit at the cost of triggering many minds at once, Bakugo seemed to have made certain conclusions as he took into the air again. It was true that the spook was a natural airborne. He had witnessed it during the fight with Namu. Fighting in the air was to fight a losing battle, and with the timer ticking, he could not waste time on just that. Bakugo flew forward, the deafening explosions booming behind him. Seeing that, the Hafa decided to add more juice to his metaphorical engine and fly even faster, even if his limit was far from that number. The audience wanted some show, he was giving it to them. Besides, he didn't want to ruin the impression the recruiters might have of the others. He still wasn't sure how the system worked, and Aizawa could see that the half-ghost was once again not giving it his all. The teacher sighed. That kid had so much power and so many mental restraints that it was ludicrous. By not doing that, he was ignoring everything Aizawa had taught him and lowering his chances of getting a spot at some agency. Granted, Fenton was guaranteed to get one even with his incomplete potential, but his initial chances were lower than that of the rest. The Japanese agencies were reluctant to hire foreigners, for reasons both pragmatic and ideologic. Not to mention that his vigilante past was bound to be uncovered by the potential employers. As part of the law they had to know their heroes and sidekicks' pasts. Thus, Danny really had to perform extraordinarily to impress them enough, not stoop to a lower level because you are a young and self-righteous idiot. Unfortunately, Aizawa had to sit and hope that the boy would arrive to a proper conclusion later, when his limitations would actively hamper his advancements. Meanwhile, as the three leading classmates were too preoccupied with each other, something very unexpected happened. Danny could hear an explosion that came from far behind, and had to turn his head and meet a bizarre sight. At an incredible speed, a chunk of metal, a leftover from one of the robots that had got to the third stage who knows how, was flying their way. Its initial momentum, given by what probably was a hefty amount of mines exploding at once, was enough to launch the projectile quick enough to surpass all other contestants. And in the split seconds given to them, the Hafa could see the green-haired head that could belong to only one person. Midoriya, you sneaky bastard, Danny grinned. Unlike the case with Bakugo or Todoroki, that guy's resolve was something Phantom enjoyed to challenge. Was it because Midoriya was far more pleasant of a person? Perhaps, was it why Todoroki had chosen to challenge him of all the people? Who knows, but that alone was not going to make Danny go easier on him than the rest. The half-ghost knew that the teen would eventually slow down, even if he was steadily making it to the end of the minefield. They were still separated from the finish line by the last chunk of normal road, and despite his ingenuity, Midoriya's running speed was average, Aizawa's tests had proven that. His distance advantage was only temporary, before the half -a caught up with him. However, the sudden move seemed to make Bakugo furious. He would not let someone so clearly inferior make it past him. Danny noticed how Bakugo's speed picked up even more, and the Hafa pushed himself further, too. Midoriya landed on the ground swiftly, utilizing the remnants of the metal piece's momentum to boost his starting running speed. But he could also understand that Bakugo and Fenton were breathing down his neck. He had to give it his all, run as fast he humanly could. The two former leaders made it to him even sooner than he had expected. However, this time Bakugo could not restrain himself, and instead of going further he decided to ruin Midoriya's chances of winning. Like a plane diving for the kill, he seemed hell-bent on dive-bombing the teen, but Midoriya had been planning something since the start, wondering if he could even pull off a move that was so risky, and if there was the time to do it, it was now or never. The diving Bakugo was charging another explosion. When he saw that Midoriya's legs glowed with the same reddish tint that his hands used to show. And then, the teen jumped forward at an incredible speed, many times further than a normal human being could. From then the time slowed down from the seams, and in reality it all happened in less than a blink. Once again Midoriya caught up with the Hafa who had not slowed down for an attack like Bakugo, and then overtook him. 
The finish line was meters away, and the Hafa did not know how many. He risked it and created a portal that launched him further, in an attempt to cover what little of a distance remained between them. And only that ability, the one that shaved off a fraction of a second, made it count. And we have a winner, everybody. Present Mike bellowed with excitement. Fenton Daniel from Class 1A is victorious, with Midoriya Izuku taking the second spot. Only zero, two of a second behind. What a show everyone. And as he shouted, so did the excited crowd. Perhaps the most excited of all was one particular PR manager that jumped from excitement and shouted from her seat. Tsukachi sighed and rubbed his temples, but underneath it all he was smiling, as the screens kept showing more students that arrived one after another. He might not have been the one to raise or train that kid, but as the boy's guardian he was incredibly proud. Splendid. A laughter was heard across the facility where recited all for one. Kirajiri, he appears to have made himself quite comfortable with your quirk. I apologize once more for letting him do this to me, Master, the fog wielder bowed his head, also looking at the screen. Do not fret, Kirajiri. I am amused more than anything. It seems that the child is indeed someone we should look out for. I wonder if Shigaraki is watching this. He was, and he was less than happy if the scratches on his face were any indication. Meanwhile, down at the arena, ignoring the burning glare from Bakugo, who was the third to arrive, Danny turned towards Midoriya, who was plastered on the ground. Suddenly remembering what each use of his quirk entailed, Danny sat down on the grass near him. You all right there? He asked in concern. I don't know, Midoriya responded, sounding surprised that he was still conscious. How are my legs? The half a glance down, not able to see any exposed parts due to the long sport pants. But the joints seemed to be in place. Try moving them, Danny suggested. To the both teens' surprise, Midoriya was able to do that. The shocked human flipped over on the grass, on his back, and pulled the pants upwards. His skin was still healthy peach color instead of the sickly purple the usage of his quirk usually left. He had managed to use it without grave injuries, although the legs still felt incredibly wobbly. You should probably rest while you can, Danny suggested, receiving a nod. And then he grinned. That was awesome what you did in the end. The leg part was risky, but smart, too. Thanks, Fenton-san, Midoriya sat and smiled, before blushing. I actually learned by watching you. Eh? Danny raised an eyebrow. Yeah, you once said that energy is always coursing through your body. He began to ramble but you always use it in different ways through different parts of your body. You also always push yourself in the air with a huge boost, so I thought I could try that because, in a way, our quirks are similar. Danny raised an eyebrow and chuckled. Perhaps, we should try something after the tournament is over. You mean it? Midoriya asked in excitement, receiving a shrug. After such flattery, not like I can say no. Maybe we can think something up. Although I'm not sure you can now expect each use of your quirk to work the way it did just now. Be careful. And then the two of them fist pumped. Phantom was not used to applause of such scale. An innocent denizen of Amity Park would have been surprised to hear this. But then they would come to remember how fleeting the ghost boy's presence was. Danny always remembered that with every ghost that made their presence known, terrorizing the humans in a public spot, came an additional package in the form of trigger-happy hunters. And with the perpetrator captured inside a thermos, that left only one specter in their sights. Thus, the half and never stuck around for long, unable to often see the grateful adorers. That, coupled with him having to maintain a semblance of normal life, and the crowd's dislike of the ghost teenager, led to the situation he was in now. His embarrassed self. He enjoyed the fact that the attention was not fearful in any way, perhaps even adoring in a way. But he still visibly shrunk and retreated into himself as he floated in spot, waiting until the rest of the contestants would show up. The best he could do was close his eyes, lie on a non-existent couch and wait until they were called out. Many in the audience mistook it for a sudden boost of confidence within the number one student, oxymoronic as it may sound. Danny still occasionally peeked at the rest of the contestants, with Todoroki, who arrived only fourth, leaning against the wall, Midoriya anxiously pacing around and Bakugo, who also paced around, but looked ready to explode at any moment. Danny also took note of the newest arrivals, glad to see that most of his class managed to push themselves through. Actually, the entirety of his classmates made it. He probably should have given them a congratulatory speech as their class rep, but he didn't feel like it with so many extra people around. Not that any of them needed it much, being pretty happy themselves. Although Danny was soon approached by exhausted-looking Yeyarazu. Fenton-san, I need your help, she panted. What is it? Danny blinked in confusion, assuming a sitting position. The girl turned her back to him, revealing a nervous-looking Maita, who had been riding on her back all that time. 
It was a miracle they even made it quick enough like this. Can you help me pry this idiot off? Asked Momo. Danny cackled and grabbed the boy's collar, before his intangibility allowed to take Minta and his sticky balls off. You know, girls might start looking your way if you don't behave like a creep, Danny told him. Minta gave a nervous laugh, before the halfer released him and dropped him on the ground. Can't help it. You are the worst. Momo spat and looked at Danny. Thank you, Fenton Sam. You came in first, right? Yep. It didn't go as smoothly as I'd hoped, though, he chuckled. I suspected as much, Momo sighed. You should take rest until the next round, Danny suggested. I saw some water coolers out there. He pointed towards a small spot where some students were already enjoying the liquid of life. Thank you, the girl nodded curtly. Do you need any? She offered. I'll manage. Danny smirked, with his ghost form not needing any liquids to sustain himself. Eventually all the contestants made their way back to the stadium. Some were taken to the infirmary, but there were no serious damages to speak of. The students that did remain, eligible to pass to the next round, slowly gathered near the stage again, where Midnight stood, ready to speak. The first game of the first year stage is over, she declared, now let's take a look at the results. The screen showed the list of all the contestants that were the first to reach the destination, starting from Fenton and ending with Ayama, who was the last one to arrive among the fortunate 42 that were making it to the second game. It's unfortunate that some of you didn't make it. But don't worry, Midnight reassured. We have prepared other ways for you to shine, she said and lusciously licked her lips, but the next proper competition starts now. The press cavalry will be all over it. Give it your all. She waved her hand, and the image on the screen began to roll like a slot machine once more. Now then, here's the second game. I already know what it is, but what could it be? What could it be? I just said and here it is. And the image read cavalry battle. Danny sweat dropped. Ama what now? He asked and scratched his temple. Oh, right, you are a foreigner, Fenton, Kirishima spoke by his side. It's a Japanese game. Let me explain. Midnight unknowingly came to the Hafa's rescue. The participants can form the teams from two to four as they wish. As she said this, a rather comical image appeared of thirteen and present Mike struggling to carry All Might around. It's basically the same as the regular cavalry battle. But the one thing that's different is that everyone has been given points according to their place in the last game. In other words, each team has different amount of points depending on who's on the team, Yuraka mumbled. I see. Mina exclaimed in excitement. You guys don't hold back even when I'm talking, huh? Shouted Midnight suddenly, before cooling down. As you can see, the points go up by 5 points starting from the bottom, and the points assigned to the first places. Everyone, including Danny, looked up at the top of the list, and their jaws dropped in disbelief. That couldn't be right. 10 million. Phantom was suddenly feeling how all other contestants were looking at him. Hungrily, menacingly, everyone knew what that difference in points entailed. Taking him down was enough to win that match. Even those who had been the bottom feeders up to that point, like Minta, had a chance to triumph as long as they got the priceless headband in their hands. So it was basically him and his team against everyone, Ha! Huh? Contrary to the expectations of those unaware of the boy's unwavering pride in his ghost powers, Phantom smirked. That was bound to get interesting. Now then, allow me to explain the rules in more details. Your time is 15 minutes. Each team is worth the total of all their points. The riders will wear the headbands with that number on their foreheads. Your goal, to grab those from the enemy teams, as many as you can before the time runs out. Now, you have just as much time to think up of your team composition. Phantom was at the crossroads, and many were in two minds about coming up to the halfa. His classmates were most certainly aware of his power, and to them joining arms with the boy who had the biggest target on his forehead was a game with high risks and high rewards. Danny himself would have liked to have only one teammate, the bare minimum allowed for the competition. His closest friends were not opposed to the idea of joining him, but he had to think realistically about how well their quirks and ghost power synergized. They too thought hard about it. Kirishima's quirk made him a perfect tank, but it wasn't helpful in that round, especially since Danny could turn intangible and take the beating himself. Mina's acid could be theoretically used as a trap device, but there was no need to complicate what already was simple to him. Thus, his companion had to be someone who, while not necessarily covered the shortcomings, but at least significantly increased the advantage. He thought of Mei when he saw the pink-haired girl. At the very least, her gadgets made her just as unpredictable as he was. However, a short talk to her rid him of hopes of a team-up. Sorry, Fenton Sam, but I don't want my babies to share a spotlight, she said, straight as ever. And that's all she wrote. Figures she would go for Midoriya, a spot so close to the top, yet the one that won't let her be completely outshone. That could be interpreted as a compliment, but Danny was not feeling like it at all. 
or maybe she didn't want to compete with his devices which he, admittedly, hadn't thought of bringing along. It was stupid. She really craved all that attention above all, didn't she? He was seeing how all other teams were already forming, leaving less and less room for him. The clock was ticking, and the thought of having to come to midnight and beg for a teammate in front of so many terrified him beyond measure. Suddenly, against all his expectations, a thin gust of air escaped his mouth. Excuse me, a quiet and timid voice sounded by his side. Danny turned his stark-haired head to face the source. Near him stood a shorter girl with chin-length gray hair, combed in a way that it obscured the left part of her face. Under her blue eye Danny could see a small dark bag, naturally suspecting that the other one, hidden beneath the gray bangs, was the same. What made him curious was a strange way the girl carried herself. Her hands were held on the level of her elbows with her hands draped down. Can I help you? Asked Danny with a cheerful smile. Yes, I was thinking if we could team up. She spoke just as quietly and emotionlessly. Phantom blinked and scratched the back of his neck. You are from class 1B, aren't you? Is it all right? I'm sure almost none of them will mind. Almost. There are. Certain individuals. She said and gave a particular glance towards a certain blonde from her class. But my classmates have already banded together to the maximally allowed limit. I wasn't quick enough, the girl admitted and looked away. Well, aren't we kindred spirits? Get it, cause I may. Never mind, Danny mumbled, earning himself a confused look. You look like a ghost, she commented. The half a blinked. That was awfully observant of her. Well, in a way, my quirk is ghost. Any movie stuff ghosts can do, so can I yours. Poltergeist, came a brief response. I can move objects telekinetically. Danny couldn't stop a grin from arising on his face. He knew he had sensed the slither of ectoplasm correctly. Poltergeist and Phantom, eh? Doesn't sound half bad. Let's do this. What's your name? Yanagi Ryaiko. You are Fenton San, I know. No escaping the fame, Danny sighed dramatically, putting a hand over his heart. Welcome aboard then, Yanagi San. Since nobody else is coming along, I think we should talk strategy. Yanagi nodded. I don't think that I have the strength to carry you. Makes sense, Danny shrugged. I can carry you, all right. Enemies would expect us to be on the defensive, since we are already in the lead. I think we should subvert this. By collecting their headbands we will only make them more eager to attack us, Yanagi argued, retaining her emotionless tone. True, and lesser targets they have, the more they are likely to come after us. But it will also increase our margin for error. We don't have to collect all, just a couple would be enough. And Danny gave a devious smirk. It will make those remaining quite desperate. Once they realize that the highest prize is out of their reach, they will aim for the smaller fish than us. In turn, those remaining will be too busy repelling the attacks to care about us, too. In exchange for our leisure we will have to accept the inevitable risk at the start and prove to them all the futility of attacking us. You on board, this is awfully reckless, but I will trust you to decide. Mere minutes afterwards, Yanagi was already situated on the boy's back. This hadn't gone unnoticed by some contestants, surprised by a very sudden team-up. Fenton, you bastard, Minta cried quietly, seeing a lightly blushing girl's arms wrapped around Phantom's neck. The latter remained oblivious to a curious position he was in, giving a piggyback ride to a girl, instead focused on the upcoming match. Even Yanagi opted not to look down, instead putting on a headband, as they went to assume the positions at their own corner of the field. I have a question, the girl spoke. Shoot, Danny tilted his head backwards, facing her. I saw that you are capable of flight. We could simply go out of their reach. Yeah, but we are here for a reason. It's to impress our dearest viewers and potential employers. Have to give my companion a chance to shine. Two, he grinned sheepishly, before facing forward again. And besides, I won't put it past them to pull something off. Let's save it for later. Do you have a plan on how we handle them? Your quirk limits. The weight of what I can lift is about that of a human body. A quick response followed. HM wonder if we can change that. Danny mumbled, confusing the girl. We'll stick with what we have for now. We need just a couple of headbands. Use your power to snatch them. I'll take care about our defense. You should concentrate on theirs. Just hold on tight, because it will be a very quick ride. Very well. But what did you mean by change? As the Hafa took his time explaining the details, surprising the girl with its strangeness, the time to begin was slowly approaching. Truth be told, Yanagi wasn't sure what to make of her impromptu teammates so far, with how eccentric he was and how outlandish his plans sounded. But what she had seen in the previous round, along with what Kendo had shared, made her confident that they could stand their ground for some time at the very least. And besides, she had already known what the boy's quirk was called, and thus got somewhat curious. All right, our teams seem to be ready. 
present Mike spoke. Now, counting down to the battle royale. 3. Danny could see how everyone's hungry eyes were turned towards them. 2. There was no doubt in his mind about their own plans. 1. Well, the small spectral team was gonna show them. Start. Midnight declared and unleashed the contestants. Like an open book, Danny thought as he saw every team make a beeline straight towards them. The quickest, or rather, simply the closest team was comprised of Class B members, with Tetsu Tetsu, the loud guy Danny had already seen, being the rider. You aren't running away, he shouted. That was never the intention, Phantom smirked, before pushing forward. Even Yanagi was caught off guard by how quick her teammate was. She had barely maintained her hold over the half his shoulders, much less pulled off what the teen had wanted. Only when the initial momentum died off and Phantom assumed a normal running speed could Yanagi turn towards her classmates and now competition. She raised her palm, and the headband around Tetsu Tetsu's forehead started to glow with purplish light. With a corner of his eye Danny saw it and smirked at the familiarity of the power, but so did their opponent. What the? I ain't giving it. He shouted and used his free hand, unoccupied with keeping himself steady, to keep it in place. Suddenly, the half of felt resistance as he ran, as if he had stepped into sand. Looking down, he saw that the ground had turned mushy, like quicksand, and the trace of this changed area led towards one of Team Tetsu Tetsu members, one with a rather off-putting lipless smile. Danny grinned and floated upwards and forward, before letting his eyes glow brighter. The next moment, a tiny streak of light escaped them, hitting the gray-haired rider's hand, burning it, and making him loosen the grip from the sudden pain. Yanagi pulled, and the headband flew right into her hand before the two landed a considerable distance away from their team with Danny sliding across the ground and lifting a cloud of dust. Well, would you look at that? Present Mike shouted. Looks like the lead team is not satisfied with their 10 million. Leave some for others, kids. He joked. No, not in the mood. Danny shrugged as best as he could with someone on his back. Good job, Yanagi, he said and received an affirmative nod. They are limiting the others' options, Aizawa thought in realization. This will move the attention from them for a while. But if they play that game for too long... He could see that Fenton's choice of strategy and team was quite befitting him. Not only because of that stupid poltergeist joke, a single rider on his back was giving him enough mobility and did not obscure his sight in any way. Furthermore, it allowed him to easily take to the air without the whole team dangling behind. And he could see the effectiveness of Phantom's aggressive strategy from the actions of Tetsu Tetsu team. Instead of going for the team of specters, too far from them to risk it, they turned the attention towards the team nearest to them. Thus, two teams at the very least were off the leader's back, and in general many seemed to have realized the futility of an endless goose chance against the man with teleportation power. Instead, it turned into a true battle of everyone versus everyone. Team Fenton remained unperturbed for only the briefest of moments, because very soon he saw Bakugo's team heading straight for them. Sheesh, come on, Kirishima, you and Mina are better than this, Danny mumbled with amusement. He shouldn't have been surprised. Despite his character, Bakugo was a reliable powerhouse, thus his friends chose to flock to his side for the time being. And this time, it was better not to anger him just yet. Phantom's strategy was precisely about not letting many pursuers come after them. But Danny could see that Bakugo held on to his headband. He knew what they could pull off, but his offensive potential was suffering due to one hand. The only source of his explosions, being occupied. A pleasant, unintended advantage. Team Fenton turned to face the incoming threat. Give it to me, spook. Bakugo demanded, charging an explosion. When they got close enough, Phantom summoned an energy barrier between the two teams, and the explosion hit the shield and dispersed, right after the enemy's team stumbled. The force of the explosion made them take several steps backwards, as they almost dropped their rider. Danny stood where he was, albeit his own teammate instinctively moved backwards, fearing that the explosion might hit her. You can't break through without feeling the full force of what you do. Number two, Danny could not resist the temptation and spoke up. On his own Bakugo could maneuver, but not when he was a part of the team that tried to carry him around. Before Bakugo could do anything else, the opposing team was already in the air. Geez, that's unfair, Mina mumbled. Come back here, Bakugo yelled, before doing something completely unexpected. He himself took to the air, ignoring all protests, and surprise of his teammates. The explosions propelled him forward and towards the floating target. He obviously aimed higher than half his head. Yanagi saw the opportunity to take the enemy's headband, and she went for it in spite of the threat to their own. Bakugo had no time to grab the piece of fabric when it slid off his head. 
he saw it fly towards the enemy team, but managed to grab the headband at the last second. While it still was within his reach, the burden too heavy, Yanagi had to let go. But not for a second had Bakugo slowed down in the process. He held onto the girl's small hand, but immediately felt something hit his stomach with tremendous force. The blonde was sent downwards, having let go of the intangible opponent. His teammates barely managed to catch him, but Kirishima's hardened legs managed to prevent the whole team from collapsing under the improvised projectile. The crowd was elated by the brief yet exciting clash. You really should calm down, back you go, Siro commented. Shut up, tape man. The blonde spat and showed two headbands in his hand, his and Tetsu Tetsu's, which Yanagi had inconsiderately held in her hand. Just do what I say. That could have gone better, Danny commented, keeping a cool head. Their winning headband had not gone anywhere. You could have used your quirk sooner, Yanagi pointed out. Phantom smirked. But should I? He showed confidence in his untold plan. Although, is it alright for him to go rogue like that? Yes it is. Midnight shouted cheerfully. As long as his feet never touch the ground. The half as grin turned devious, making Mina and Kirishima gulp. The last catch was merely a fluke. The next time he was bound to aim more precisely. Fenton, Yanagi suddenly called and got the half his attention. At the last second Fenton flew back and dodged a why no. It was the tongue of only one person in that arena. Danny's green eyes turned to the side, facing Shoji of all people running towards him. He wondered where Tsu's tongue had come from, but then he caught the sight of someone on his back, shielded from all sides by Shoji's gargantuan, webbed arms. Now that's something you don't see every day, Danny mumbled. Are we going to do something? Yanagi asked, before from the inside of their improvised tank formation flew Minta's purple balls and Tsu's floppy tongue. Team Minta makes use of their overwhelming difference in sizes. Present Mike said excitedly. They are like a tank. Phantom kept himself and his teammate in the air, displaying the wonders of agility, until he managed to grab Tsu's tongue and hold it. I am really sorry for that, Tsu. Danny shouted, before his eyes turned blue. To the surprise of the audience, a part of the girl's tongue was instantaneously covered in a layer of ice and dropped to the ground. Tsu was immobilized and probably down with a solid brain freeze. Minta panicked, and Shoji had no long-range attacks, and thus the team was out of commission. Or, at least, Team Fenton was safe from them for the time being. Fenton disarms a whole team in just one blow. Present Mike shouted. Not so difficult when you have a whole arsenal of powers, he mumbled. Danny shot a deadpan glance in direction of the announcer, before he felt the shaking on his back. Turning his head, the Hafa noticed that Yanagi was not looking good and winced. He had forgotten about his rider, and that humans could get nauseous after such pirouettes. Sorry about that, too, he mumbled. I'll try to keep steady from now on. Back with the audience, it was positively elated at seeing such a powerful contestant. The managers scribbled down yet another ability in the boys' possession. The viewers, be it the heroes, journalists or normal folks, had already been shocked by the few powers Fenton had already displayed. Flight, intangibility and portals, to name a few. And the number was growing in their eyes, and in the eyes of one particular fire-controlling pro, who couldn't help but be somewhat interested now. The fight went on, and Fenton's bet had worked out in some aspects. Seeing Team Minta's weakness, other teams wanted to snatch their prize. That saved Danny some trouble at least. Alrighty then, present Mike announced. It's been seven minutes already. Let us take a look at the scoreboard. The screens showcased that right below Team Fenton was Bakugo's, with their two high-valued headbands. But then, in a second, the image flicked, and suddenly the blonde's team plummeted to the sixth place. Huh? Bakugo felt how the headband slid off his forehead, and his first reaction was telekinesis. But no, there was someone else behind them. Class 1 is too simple-minded, commented a blonde teen from the opposing class, twirling back Hugo's headband around his finger. He got us, Mina exclaimed. Give that back bastard. Back Hugo yelled. I'll kill you. Midnight said it was the first game. The boy responded collectively, but not without smug. It wouldn't make sense for them to cut a ton of people in the qualifier, right? Assuming they'd keep about 40 people for the next stage, we just made sure we stayed in that number as we ran. Observing from the back the personalities and quirks of our opponents. There's no point in obsessing over winning the prelims, right? Danny could hear it from above and didn't hide his surprise. Did you know about this? He asked Inagi. Not everyone agreed with Monoma, she commented. I didn't join you for that. If you want to know, the girl was quick to reassure. Danny laughed. Well, you should have, he responded suddenly. That's an excellent plan. Wish I could see it too. Her teammate was a very odd person, Yanagi thought, before they flew their way. Phantom had a feeling Bakugo was not going to chase. This plan is better than chasing after a temporary top, Monoma continued. 
like a donkey going after a carrot dangling in front of its face. Oh, while I'm at it, you are famous, aren't you? The famed victim of the sludge villain. Tell me about it sometime, about how it feels to be attacked by a villain once a year. Fenton was a living reminder to Bakugo that his anger was always used against him. Bakugo could see it and tried to hold back, and miserably failed. Kirishima, he growled, growing a very menacing look. Change of plans. Before we go after the spook, we kill these guys first. Danny grinned. That suited his interests just fine. A question hung in many of the opponent's heads. How could they force Team Fenton to get down? Not many had the range, and what flew his way was easily avoided by his power, and Yanagi's telekinesis that kept projectiles away. But one such plan was hatched by Todoroki. He too, had observed the half-ghost. He had listened to everything he had said. And Todoroki could only assume that the boy's greatest fear of one sort of damage was there for a reason. Fenton also wasn't very imaginative whilst he remained in the lead, so the ice wielder had his hopes that that would not change. Yeah, Yorazu, I need you to create something. Phantom's intangibility protected his team from a barrage of horns shot by one of Yanagi's classmates. He could theoretically keep at it, but his teammate insisted that they did something else. She utilized her quirk to send the horns backwards, forcing the enemies to defend themselves. It was going swell for the team Fenton, but suddenly he heard Todoroki's voice. Fire, he shouted. Danny spun around and saw how Todoroki's team had shot something. Before he could do anything else, the Hafa managed to sidestep and grab the projectile just like he had done with Sue's tongue. Is this a harpoon? He said in shock. Todoroki couldn't have been trying to kill him, so why? Now, Kaminari. Danny froze. The harpoon had a rope made of iron. Indiscriminate shock, one million volts, exclaimed Kaminari and hugged the metal harpoon. The next moment, the entirety of the bright lighting was directed up the rope, and the flying team screamed in pain, and Phantom was the loudest of them. And once the electricity zap, weaker than Kaminari's limit, allowing him to continue as always, stopped. The half-ghost took a plummet to the ground. What a turn of events. Team Todoroki has shot down the lead contestant. Present Mike voiced the shock of everyone viewing the competition. The landing was rough, but slow enough to assume that it wasn't an instant injury. Both members of their team lied atop of each other, barely moving, but Team Todoroki was quick to approach them, eager to snatch the so-much-desired headband from a fallen opponent. And then Kaminari, the one closest to the fallen opponents, reached out with his free hand. Well, looks like we have a change of a leader, shouted present Mike as the screen showed the shift in numbers. But then, before Kaminari could even retract his arm, Phantoms grabbed it. Before the boy could even react, he let out a scream of pain at the deadman's grip. And then he saw a terrifying pair of burning green eyes staring at him. Something was wrong, definitely wrong. That hurt, you dipshit, Phantom growled, as the headband was dropped by the boy with the electric quirk. In a split second Danny grabbed the headband and fell into a portal alongside Yanagi, reappearing some distance away. Try that again and recovery girl won't salvage what's left. The half a threatened coldly as his hair started to float. Whoa, present Mike exclaimed, rising from his seat and hitting the audio panel in front of him. Fenton doesn't take kindly to being hit, eh? Not at all, Aizawa interrupted his friend. Even when the villains wounded him more gravely during the attack he didn't lose his head. Something else is at play. No ghost took kindly to a reminder of their painful deaths. Their reactions were always violent, causing horrific alterations to appearance and the desire to kill or maim the source of said reminder. Fenton's human side numbed the effects, for he could observe electricity, see its use, but when he himself was hit, Danny's control slipped, and it took all his restraint not to rip Kaminari apart right there. But he craved vengeance still. Phantom saw with the corner of his eye that Midoriya was not far away, too. Looking to snatch the prize, no doubt. He hadn't seen much of him before, come to think of it. Furthermore, the rest were catching up, too. They sensed the weakness he had displayed. Before Todoroki's team could traverse the five meters between them, Danny picked Yanagi up and tried to take off once more. And he knew Todoroki would not let him leave that vulnerable position. Using his right side, the scarred teen aimed slightly higher than where Phantom was. His calculation was on point, just like the glacier that managed to grasp the half-ghost's arm. It didn't hold him for long, because Danny managed to break off a piece of ice the arm was encased in and finally get a breather in the sky. Then, Danny felt Yanagi stir on his back. Good morning, he said with strained cheer. What happened? She asked. Electric charge. My favorite, grumbled Danny. And I'd say it's high time I gave you your gift. Whenever you are ready. That snapped the silver-haired girl out of her drowsiness. Yanagi could hear from his tone that Fenton would in reality not take no for answer. She saw how pissed he looked with Todoroki's team, so she hesitantly nodded. 
Danny looked at his arm, which remained frozen but was still clutching the headband. Next second, his hand glowed green, and the ice turned to steam in an instant. Shaking off the droplets of water, Danny then tossed the headband to the rider and Yanagi quickly wrapped it around her forehead. The sudden sound of a whirring engine snapped the two out of their very relative serenity. Turning towards the source, they were surprised to see Midoriya's team flying towards them. That was a high-risk game the green-haired human decided to play. Takoyami, the one in front of their horse, quickly let his avian shadow loose and sent it to face Phantom. With a bird-like screech it lunged, and not a moment too soon Phantom and Shadow grabbed each other's hands. You knew I can't go through this thing, Danny commented unenthusiastically. Ever since I saw how you reacted similarly to the fog villain I had my suspicions, responded Takoyami. Danny noticed Midoriya getting closer, trying to get the headband while the two heavy lifters were busy. Midoriya jumped on Takoyami's shoulder and then on Shadow's neck. Inagi couldn't see anything she could use. Her strength was barely enough to hold on to Phantom, who so far had been carrying her around, much less put up a fight. Her telekinesis couldn't grasp anything around, could it? But Danny knew that he had neither the time nor mood for their games. Phantom's hands flared with energy, and the burning pain made the Shadow loosen the grip. Next second Danny freed one of his hands, and a small ball of ectoplasm appeared in it. Yanagi, close your eyes. He ordered and tossed the ball between two teams. The next seconds it burst into immensely bright light, blinding those who didn't heed Phantom's warning. The one hit the most was Takoyami's shadow, which screeched from surprise and seriously shrunk in size, allowing the Hafa to free himself. The reeling shadow made Midoriya lose his footing, and with a loud yelp he almost fell, but Yuraka managed to grab him. The again weightless teen assumed his previous position, looking at the smirking half-ghost. How how did you know the shadow's weakness? Asked Midoriya, who had been told by Takoyami that almost nobody had known that fact. His is not the first shadow I see, the halfer responded, before Yanagi noticed just what was keeping them in the air. The girl raised her palm, now that Danny was helping her once more. With a swipe of her hand, one of the boots Yuraka was wearing slipped off her foot. Why? Their team could fly with one boot also, being made weightless by Yuraka's quirk. But one boot less plus the element of surprise equaled the loss of control over their position in the air. Danny grinned and fired a tiny blast from his finger, hitting the falling boot and blowing it to pieces. Then, he raised a hand for a high five. Inagi lightly slapped it, before their eyes turned towards the opponents. No, my baby, May exclaimed. It died with honor, responded Danny dramatically. He was half tempted to shoot down Midoriya's team, but he couldn't vouch for their later health, and thus decided to simply make distance once more, especially since his new main target was currently running beneath, alongside the rest of the teams. A very wicked idea came up in his mind, as he turned towards Yanagi. Are you ready now? I need your full attention, you know. The girl nodded. I hope what you weren't wrong. Danny smirked and landed on the ground. So do I. The next second, they both were surrounded by green light, and everyone was left wondering what the two had had in mind since the start. But nonetheless, the most prized headband was still within reach, and so, while not forgetting about the closest competition, they still circled round them. Don't resist this feeling, Danny mumbled, seeing how said circle's radius was getting shorter, and his eyes were still focused on that ice-controlling bastard. I'll keep the excess energy so you don't die on spot, you simply use your quirk as you always do. That didn't sound very reassuring. The first to run forward was Tetsu Tetsu's team, still lacking their headband and craving revenge. The others soon followed suit. Todoroki opted to stay behind the clash, and Midoriya decided to do the same, as his team finally landed back on the ground. They clearly saw that Phantom was planning something. But then, Yanagi outstretched her hands, and released the power that she was feeling in her veins. It felt overwhelming, more than her body could handle. But Phantom hadn't lied about keeping everything in check. And then, surrounded by green light, all other teams froze in spot, unable to move. The crowd once again received what they had desired and cheered. Each overturn was welcomed by their minds, so hungry for the show. Yanaga's eyes widened in shock. So far she hadn't been able to lift a single person, much less keep 40 in place. What in the? Kendo spoke, trying to break free just like all the rest. How did you do that, yanagi Sam? She asked loudly, since her jaw was still able to move. I have an answer. Danny grinned toothily and raised a finger, beginning to approach one particular team, without sparing Kendo a glance. Why should Yanagi-san limit herself to random energies when I have enough for both, enough to empower Yanagi's quirk tenfold if need be? He laughed. I think it's much more than ten times, quietly commented Yanagi, still concentrating on keeping everyone tied. 
Looks like the lead team is no longer playing around. Present Mike shouted. It will take some effort getting out of our resident specter's hold. Phantom was evidently making a beeline straight towards Team Todoroki. On his way the half a whistled a tune and picked a couple of random headbands from Monoma, the blonde copycat, for he was obviously holding on to too many. Their team watched the smirking half-ghost with fury, and Monoma appeared to be the angriest one. You'll pay for that, he hissed. Save it for the next round, would you? If you make it, Danny turned to leave, theatrically tossing the headbands in the middle of the arena, but still keeping the best one. And the numbers on the scoreboard turned much sadder. Only our class gets to mock number two. Remember it well, he said much quieter. Meanwhile, everyone was trying their hardest to escape the dead grip Yanagi had on all of them. The girl was feeling increasingly fatigued, but she could still hold them. The longer the better for their currently unchanged lead. But enough physical strength, or rather, the opposing force, could allow to break out of the specter's trap. And thus, each tried to do just that, each in a different manner. But nonetheless, the ghost team made it to Todoroki's. Just like I said the last time, pal, Phantom grinned, floated slightly upward and grabbed the headband. This won't be enough. Ida watched the scene with terror, for with so little time left, they would never get back to the previous spot. But it also meant that they could go all in. He had to try the move he had been practicing. There would not be another time. Before Danny could pry the main, most prized headband off Todoroki's forehead, the engines on Ida's legs stirred, unburdened by the paralysis consuming the entire arena. And then, the pipe spurted the fire of reactive engine, and in a single explosion, he overturned the situation. Surprised by the sudden pressure of immense proportions, Yanagi could not hold them for long, and finally, the spell broke. All the momentum that had been building up was released in but a moment, and Todoroki's team burst forward, free and still in possession of their headband. Whoa! Present Mike exclaimed. What what happened? So fast, so fast. Ida, if you could accelerate that fast, then show us in the prelims. Inaga's broken concentration was enough to release hell, as her grip was broken, and the fatigue finally caught up with her. In the meantime, Todoroki's team came to a halt hundred meters away, still majorly shocked by what had just happened. What was that? Todoroki asked the panting speedster, as the fight broke out not so far away for the free headbands Phantom had dropped specifically for that purpose. By forcing the torque and rotations to increase, I created an explosive force. With the recoil, however, my engine will be useless until the end of the match, Eater responded and looked at the smoking pipes. It's a secret move I haven't shown anyone yet. Danny and Yanagi turned towards the team. Also stunned by what Ida had managed to pull off and preserve their team's second place. You holding up, Yanagi-san? The Hafa asked, disgruntled by the loss of opportunity. I'm alright, she put a hand to her head. But I won't be able to repeat what we did. That's bad, Danny hissed, as the anger with Todoroki's group still lingered. There's also the next round, Fenton-san, the girl mumbled tiredly. And we are still on top. The half aside, fine, I suppose you are right. Yanagi obviously needed some rest, he couldn't push her to get revenge of such small scale. It was better to once more get to the sidelines and let others fight over the rest, lest her human body sustain something other than fatigue. That's why he preferred fighting alone. Nobody to think of, to concern oneself about the only person in harm's way was potentially you alone. However, his own reluctance did not mean that the rest was going to let him go easily like that. Certainly, most opted to try and scramble for the lesser headbands, but Monoma wanted to get back at the specters for dropping him from second to sixth spot, and potentially stand at the top. He had a plan, and for that he needed to get closer. His team ran towards where the half-ghost stood, conversing with Yanagi, but the blonde soon heard a commanding voice behind them. Wait. I said wait. Bakugo yelled. Geez, so persistent, Monoma grumbled. That guy was more trouble than he was worth. As a hero, this quality. An explosion interrupted his banter as Bakugo flew in his direction. Tsuraba, guard. Monoma commanded to his teammate. The next second, the auburn-haired teen breathed out a gust of air, and in an instant it solidified, creating a lens-like obstacle Bakugo hit. Bakugo furiously rammed on the wall that appeared invisible to a naked eye, and Monoma's team turned away about to pursue the specters once more. But then, another powerful strike followed. Bakugo broke through the air wall and grabbed Monoma by the last headband hanging on his neck. A ripping motion later, and Bakugo came into possession of the piece of fabric and would have fallen on the ground, but Siro was quick to grab the blonde and pull him back on his steed. Team Bakugo seizes the last headband and jumps to the third place. Present Mike announced. The explosion wielder smirked triumphantly at seeing Monoma's team plummet to the bottom but that left the rest of the adversaries he sought to trample. 
he saw how Midoriya ran towards where Fenton was, and that put two of his most hated people in one spot. Perfect. We are going after the spooks next, Bekugo declared. Eh? Mina asked. Are you sure we should risk it? We are still getting to the next round. I am not letting that bastard get ahead of me. The blonde barked, so go, knowing that the one holding all their headbands would simply go in by himself if they declined. The three other teammates obliged. In the meantime, Danny saw how Midoriya was coming closer. Todoroki as well was aiming for the Hafa and his teammate. It appeared that neither team was satisfied with being second, whilst Midoriya sought a shot at getting to the fourth place, and it should not have mattered who he was going to take the headband from. So, two on one it is, eh? Phantom asked sarcastically, for it wasn't just his victory on the line here, was it? Yanagi was there too, and if she trusted him to lead them to victory, he would do just that. The first to lunge forward was Midoriya, with Takoyami's shadow brandishing its claws once more. Phantom charged an ectoblast and jumped away, firing at the creature. He knew he could go wild on the ectoplasmic being, and it seemed to shrug off the initial blast, more fearful of the light it emitted. An own pet ghost, Takoyami was lucky with his quirk. The shadow lunged again, and Phantom summoned a shield in front of his palm to protect himself and push the creature backwards, before noticing another team approaching from his side. A metal rod in Todoroki's hand, courtesy of Yeyurazu, and the conduit for his powers during the match, was once again covered in ice before he hit the ground with it, letting a tsunami of ice towards the Hafa. Phantom saw that, and his free hand released a ray of ectonergy, enough to melt whatever emerged from the ground in an instant. At that moment, Shadow decided to play smart and circumvented the shield, seemingly trying to bit the half-ghost with its beak. Danny once again jumped backwards, and the shield dispersed. Hiroraka, Midoriya exclaimed. The girl followed his unspoken command and used the only boot on her leg to propel the entire team forward. It was at that time Bakugo's team caught up with them, and the blonde did not hesitate to jump towards the three. I'll get you, spook. Phantom prepared to meet another offensive, but then he heard the call he dreaded most. Kaminari. Todoroki yelled when they got close enough. Don't you dare. Phantom roared and prepared a devastating blast in his palm, enough to wipe all three teams at once. And then, time's up, came up the yell from present Mike. And that made the contestants first freeze in shock, and then they, and the team leaders in particular, were faced with a rush of emotions of different kinds. Bakugo dropped on the ground, his face kissing the ground and started hitting the ground with anger. Midoriya turned fearful, not knowing if his team made a cut. Danny felt relieved that he was not going to experience another case of ghostly PTSD equivalent. Todoroki didn't show whatever was on his mind. The half a turned towards his teammate, who luckily had the strength to get off his back and stand on her own. We made it, right? She asked a bit groggily, and still feeling a headband on her, sighed in relief. Danny grinned. We sure did. With more than weight he looked at his hands, belt, touched his neck. Where was Monoma's headband? All right, present Mike shouted. Let's see the results, he said as the scoreboard showed up. First place belongs to Team Fenton, which hasn't lost its prized headband for the whole match. I just thought of it, Danny mumbled, rubbing the back of his neck. Isn't it technically Team Yanagi? He looked at the girl. You are the rider? No. Yanagi didn't say anything initially. It's nothing important. Second place Team Todoroki, ones that got close enough and managed to get the lead team. I'm sorry, everyone, Ida forcefully said to his teammates. I was too brash and acted without thinking. That's not true, Yeyorazu reassured him. Had it not been for you, we would have lost. Team Bakugo comes third. Well, ain't too bad, Mina shrugged. Yeah, third place is neat. Also, Siro agreed. Tell that to someone who is in the third place again. Kirishima deadpanned as he pointed at hysterical Bakugo. Coming fourth is Team Wait, when did they team Midoriya? The most surprised of all was perhaps the green-haired boy himself. Hey, what how? Hearing a cough, everyone turned towards Takoyami, and his shadow, which held the headband with the number 305 in its beak. Monoma's headband. Kaminari's upcoming attack seemed to greatly frighten Fenton. His whole attention was on Todoroki, so Shadow was able to snatch it. I tried to get the 10 million, but I didn't have the time. Danny would have paled if his ghost skin was capable of that. Had, had he really been so close to being a complete loser, he had underestimated Takoyami greatly. He had thought he knew how his avian classmate's quirk functioned. Turns out he was more inventive than Johnny, who would have thought. With a heavy sigh, Danny let himself turn back into his human form. Those were hectic 15 minutes. Now we will take an hour's break for lunch and recreational activities. Present Mike added, enjoy yourselves until then. Hey, Eraser, let's go grab some snack. I'm going to sleep, came a curt answer. Before Danny could join his friends and leave the arena, he felt a hand stopping him. 
That was Yanagi. Fenton Sam. I wanted to thank you. It seems I'm the only one from my class that made it thanks to you. I Danny shifted in his spot. I'm not sure if you should thank me. We are also the ones that stopped your classmates from getting higher, too. I know, but I still appreciate your help. I was also meaning to ask, is that power you gave me permanent? Danny suggested and hummed. I know of cases when ectoplasm clung to a human body without harming it. Your quirk might just make some of it stick. And maybe that's what made you feel so overwhelmed, he rambled. So maybe some of it stayed and will allow you some greater control. Well, if so, go on and enjoy it, he grinned and turned to leave. Thanks for your help, too. The lunchtime was a welcome time off for the half-ghost. He needed those calories after the generous waste of the first two rounds. Danny wished to join his friends and classmates at the cafeteria, and on his way he was catching certain glances. He wasn't much different from many of his fellow students, for all of them were the centerpiece of attention. But his prowess must have made him very well known among the visitors. So, he should have expected that attention even outside of the arena. All that's left was to thank the organizers for keeping the press out until the end of the festival. But at this point Danny started to enjoy this. His pride with himself was slowly overlapping the embarrassment. Nonetheless, his journey through the many festival stands to the place of nourishment was interrupted once again. When on his way the half-ghost encountered his guardian and Makoto, who had been looking for him after the match. That was a good job out there, Danny, the detective commented with a smile, making his charge smirk. Was there ever any doubt? Phantom asked. Well, I am impressed. For one, said Makoto, it's every bit as Naomasa described. It was when Danny noticed another person near the two, the one who barged forward with a bright grin on his face. The blonde jock-looking hero in a retro-futuristic outfit decided to speak. Well, color me impressed, kid, he spoke in English. This is one awesome quirk you've got. Danny blinked. Who are you? He asked, making the hero deflate, much to Makoto's amusement. She laughed and patted the hero's shoulder. That's Captain Celebrity, one of the top American heroes. I am his manager. Oh, was Danny's intelligent response. Nice to meet you, then. The man didn't appear very pleased to be an obscure figure to his supposed countryman. And the halfa came to notice that. I'm surprised you don't know me. The hero voiced his emotions. Sorry, Danny offered weakly. If it's any better, I know very few heroes. So it's not just you. That's not the best consolation, Captain grumbled. Is he going to be trouble like Koichi, Makoto? I am still here, Phantom responded instead. He never liked to be discussed whilst he was there. You saw that I can fight. Makoto sighed. Captain, I already explained his situation to you. No need to bother him. Hey, you want to hire the kid, but it is me who will have to cover him if he does something stupid. I am not running a daycare. You are right. I run this daycare, the woman smirked. Look, you two, Tsukachi decided to intervene. Danny must be tired after the two rounds. Maybe you should save it for later, don't you think? Captain smirked. Yeah, sounds about right. I've wanted to go for lunch, anyhow, he said and turned to the half-dead teen. See you around, Danny boy. Don't take what I said close to heart. The man ruffled Danny's hair and strolled away towards one of the stands. Makoto sighed and followed him, leaving the halfa and the detective alone. I don't like him, Phantom commented. He's just concerned, I think. Makoto can be very biased when it comes to hiring practices. Can't say it doesn't work out in the end, but Captain obviously doesn't want to take that initial risk. You all see what I can do. Being a hero is not just about defeating villains, is it? Don't worry, I'm sure he is just acting all tough. Perhaps he already made up his mind. I know he trusts Makoto a lot. The detective is reading people again. Danny asked sarcastically. Maybe, Tsukachi winked. He reminds me of my school bully. Tsukachi sighed. Nobody is forcing you to accept Makoto's offer. Think of it as a safer option, in case you don't get any better offers. There's also something else I wanted to talk to you about. It's about that outburst you had out there. I've never seen you like this. Danny looked away. It's just it brings back an awful memory. Each time I get a violent shock, I become ballistic and hyper-aggressive. It's some sort of a coping mechanism. My sister has a theory that my brain wants to subdue the pain. And that's the solution my quirk creates. I get a strong desire to snap the neck of the one who did this. Sukacha's look turned worried. That's not okay at all, Danny. I can control it, the halfer responded. I'm still human enough, he mumbled. That was a very strange choice of words on Danny's part. Are you absolutely sure? Old man, even if I turned into an angsty potato that lied on the ground. Be honest, what could you do? Danny crossed his hands. It's pretty much confirmed that ectoplasm stimulates my brain in a way hormones of aggression do when it happens. So you either remove the power cell that keeps me alive or do nothing. 
Not much of a choice, Tsukachi agreed. I suppose, electrical quirks are not that common, and you hold yourself fine enough. Told ya, murderous spree ain't happening. I promise, Danny beamed. But I will be beating those people harder than usual. Can't say I'm satisfied, but you are right. Nothing can be done as we speak. I think you should go join your friends. And for the last time, I'm fine, old man. I can keep going. Then keep at it, Danny. I'm sure you'll win this. Danny nodded, before parting ways with his guardian. He made his way towards the cafeteria, buying some snacks from the stands along the way. In retrospect, it was maybe some good publicity. Some people wanted to take pictures with him, and Danny was quite embarrassed to be frank. Each petitioner could see it, but he couldn't bring himself to say no. Thus, the internet soon received a small influx of images where Danny tried his best to appear confident. The word tried should be accentuated. Other contestants didn't seem to have this much trouble from the seams. Eventually the Hafa did make his way towards the cafeteria and his friends. After the customary emergence out of nowhere to the scare of everyone else involved, Danny could finally enjoy some good food in the company of his classmates. I wonder what the next round will be, Mina said. I'm getting all hyped up already. There are 12 of us, Danny responded. So I guess it's a bunch of 1v1 matches. That's right, but they change what those matches are each year. Last time it was a Chenbara match, Kirishima said, before noticing Fenton's befuddled expression. Think of fencing, but with samurai swords and techniques. And quirks, Danny finished. That's kinda cool. Wish I knew fencing. Could add some nice style. Don't you have enough? It's never enough for the likes of me, Danny smirked. You just have to stop yourself before long. One friend of mine suggested some instructors, but I declined. I mean, I got a couple of lessons. I know how to swing the thing, but that's pretty much it. My supernatural reaction helps a bit. His expression then turned more serious. I really hope it's something more conventional this time. Eh, I guess some of us got scores to settle, grinned Mina and nudged the Hafa. Got that part right, Danny responded and took a bite out of a hamburger, as his eyes drifted towards one of the targets of his future revenge. The Hafa simply returned to his food, but he was soon nudged once more by his red-headed friend. What is it, pal? Danny asked. Hey, check those out. He pointed at a bunch of white girls in cheerleading uniforms. What's that thing about? Cheerleaders. Seriously? Danny deadpanned, as the girls noticed him staring and giggled. Do I look funny? He asked Kirishima. Come on, man. You are skilled in combat but denser than me. Someone is in his popular phase. The half aside. I know that. Had a chance to see it firsthand. So they are fangirls, huh? Or they laid their eyes on you. Mina rolled hers. Sheesh. Sometimes I wonder if it's just an act of yours. Huh? Danny sounded genuinely surprised. Oh, that way. I ain't falling for it again. The last cheerleader I dated had her mind taken over all along. I? Both of his friends asked simultaneously. Some time after the half was, surprisingly, approached by his purple-haired classmate of all people. Can I help you, Maita? Danny asked. Yeah, Fenton San. I was wondering if you're doing something about the upcoming cheer battle. Cheer dot 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 what are you talking about? Phantom rubbed his temple. Yeah, Minta, please explain, Mina added. So you don't know. We just heard from Aizawa that the girls will be taking part in a cheer battle. You should have known this as a class rep. If Minta was looking straight into Danny's eyes, he would have immediately given away that something was not right. I can't say I know that, the halfer rubbed the back of his neck, before shrugging. Then again, I am a lousy rep. Don't worry, Fenton San. I've already told the girls. Of course you have, Danny deadpanned. Wait, didn't Aizawa say he was going to have a nap? Oh, he just dot said this before going. The Hafa didn't feel like he believed Minta's words. Before he could address this, however, the small boy had already left. Something told him that he should verify that information and save the girls some humiliation. He had an idea for a shorter way. Kendo could be the solution to his problem. It didn't take long for him to find her. Being Inaga's best friend, she was bound to stay close to the one holding on to Phantom's ectonergy, the one he could sense clearly, that came across creepier than intended. Nonetheless, a brief talk to the redhead and the ever-shy former companion of his, a rather embarrassing one to be more precise, clarified one thing, that someone was full of shit. And what do you know, one of those people turned up just here and then. He, Fenton-san, came Kaminari's hesitant voice that soured Phantom's mood. Kaminari, Danny greeted. Look, dude, I was just meaning to say I'm sorry, all right. You told all of us about your trauma, but I still went along with that plan. The half a shrugged. A bit early for that, he responded. We still have a round ahead of us. You only have one attack, so if we fight dot you get the idea. Oh, aim. I'm sorry for that in advance. Danny gave a devious smirk. 
What makes you think I'll let you even take a step, though? He asked, making the human teen gulp. All right, you are forgiven. But just so you know, I'll do anything to stop that from repeating. Even if it means beating you unconscious, Danny patted Kaminari on the shoulder and went back to his friends. The electricity-wielding teen released a sigh, full of hopes that he wouldn't have to face that menace again. But, one thing he had indisputably achieved he managed to buy some time for his and Minta's plan. Danny returned to his friends, who by then had finished their own lunch, and he found only Kirishima. She decided to join the rest just in case. They were in a hurry, the redhead explained. Ain't that just peaky, Danny grumbled. Hey, maybe it's not so bad, Hiroshima said slowly, not entirely opposed to the idea of his girl classmates in nice outfits. I don't think they will share your opinion. Come on, Danny, the redhead wrapped his arm around his friend's neck. I know you are dense, but you really gotta start enjoying what you can get. All we are getting is a bunch of girls who are going to stick out and die from embarrassment, responded Phantom. And only I get to be a dead man walking here, he added, before the bell rang. The bell that signalized the end of the lunchtime and called for the people present to gather in the stadium once more. Welp, they are screwed now. Maybe we will catch up to them. They couldn't have gotten far, Kirishima said, accepting his friend's stance. Honestly, why did the usually uncaring teen have to act so incessantly serious at the most inappropriate times? The two friends made their way to the arena, but the girls must have departed earlier and had taken a different route, for Danny and Kirishima didn't see them on the way to the stadium before it was too late. There they were, dressed in cheerleader uniforms they had taken from God knows where. The boys' surprise was not as profound as others, for they at least knew that this was going to happen. From their faces Danny could read just what he had expected, and he couldn't help a slight sense of guilt coming up. He could go faster, but his less celibate celibate side must have been at fault. He couldn't make out what the girls were talking about over the noise of the crowd. But he saw Minta and Kaminari relishing that view. So those two were involved, Danny grumbled, realizing that he had been tricked. Gonna take revenge for that too. Nah, this one the girls can handle, I think, the half a shrugged, before noticing the confused glances other students were giving the girls of class 1A. It was a strong form of Spanish shame. But, whilst empathizing with their plight, he knew there were more important things. He had made it to the final round, and he was there to win. Kaminari and Todoroki had done no small job in igniting his competitive spirit. The goal was far from noble, but it was clear and worth striving for in the eyes of a creature as vengeful as a ghost, even if partial. To make sure those two were trampled beneath him was all the revenge he could allow himself. It was, after all, the most humane way of doing so. His partial kin usually picked a different approach. After the actual cheerleaders, who, as present Mike explained, were invited all the way from America, finished their show, all students, even those who had failed the last two rounds, were invited towards the stage where midnight was waiting for them. All right, everyone, let's have some fun competing in the recreational games. When that's over, the 16 participants that made it into the final round will duke it out tournament style, one-on-one. -on -one. And upon this, a lot of observant people noticed one huge discrepancy both on the screen and what was being said. Wait, Sue mumbled and turned towards her raven-haired classmate. Fenton-san, your team had only two members, Kiro. Danny nodded. Yep, guess we're in for a last-minute surprise, he said sarcastically, before turning to Kirishima, who had stars in his eyes. You all right, man? I'm going to stand on the same stage that I watch every year on TV, he said. Now, let's draw our lots and decide on the bracket. Midnight pulled out a box. Now, many of you probably wonder how we are filling the last two remaining slots, since we only have 14 winners. It has been decided that the captains of the fifth and sixth teams shall be allowed to take part as well. That meant two new contestants. Class B immediately looked towards the members of Team Tetsu Tetsu and their corresponding captain, who wore a shocked expression on his face. Really? He asked. But all members of our team just as much as I did. Maybe, said his teammate, the one with lipless face and revealed teeth, and put a hand on the teen's shoulder. But you still showed that you deserve getting into the next round. Do you agree? He looked at the other two teammates, who nodded in agreement. See, the loudmouthed teen resisted the urge to shed a manly tear, showing how touched he was by the trust. I will do my best, he promised and punched his palm. We're sure you will. Kendo gave a thumbs up. Hey, Yanagi-san. Tetsu Tetsu excitedly called for the quiet girl. Guess we both got in. Inagi gave a small smile and nodded. And the sixth team was not as vocal about their choice. Shinso was the team's captain, but neither the congratulations nor relief was shown. To be frank, none of them felt like they themselves deserved getting further, save for Ayama. Shinso's feelings, however, remained an enigma, just like his quirk. Danny stared at him for some time, trying in vain to read him. 
but the teen was like a stone in that regard. He shared that air with Aizawa, the halfer realized, but did not say this. Then arrived the time to draw lots. The matches were quite intriguing. As such, Tetsu Tetsu was going to be faced by Kirishima, two teens of great physical strength and the ability to withstand a great deal of damage. The next pair were Takoyami and Yeyurazu, an interesting pick as well, for one could counteract the shadow with light-emitting devices, but were too different in fighting styles to make that interesting. They were followed by a pair of girls, Mina was facing off against Yanagi, and the audience was left wondering how they could properly use their quirks against one another. One would have to be either inventive or redundant. The list went on, showing several more intriguing matches, with Midoriya being put against the enigmatic general studies student. Or, finally, Fenton facing off against Kaminari. When the latter read that, he prayed that he had misread. But no, everyone shot him sympathetic glances, but when Kaminari turned to Fenton, he saw a grisly, toothy grin flash towards him, and a pair of devious toxic green eyes. I'm so dead, Kaminari said with a meek voice. I'll take good care of your daujinshi, Kaminari-san, Minta reassured. I gave you no permission. After every matchup was agreed upon and written down, present Mike continued his job as a narrator. All right, now when that's out of way, let's commence a momentary interlude. What followed next was a round of recreational games. The contestants for the next round were allowed to skip those, and many decided to use the time off to prepare, each in a different manner. Some devised their strategies, some rested, focusing on what was coming next. Danny decided to unwind, so he chose to play as well, without relying much on his powers. After his duplicate had brought snacks and water from the cellars standing outside, joined by Kirishima, they soon decided to go on a scavenger hunt a harmless activity aimed at making the students and the viewers ease up. Besides, the journalists and agents did not go anywhere, although the interest from them was evidently much smaller. Good publicity was good, no matter what size. All right, what have you got? Asked Danny as Kirishima flipped his card. Sunglasses, he responded. Ew, a dog, the halfer responded dryly. Just kill me again. There were other games, like a ball race, and in general it was good time. Perhaps Danny could come across as careless, indulging in the games instead of making preparations. But in all honesty, he was not the only finalist who took that time off. He saw others competing in that friendly round. His eyes caught Yanagi during the ball race. She was obviously using that time to get accustomed to the augmented quirk of hers. He noticed that without his presence, her quirk manifested with purple glow still, but it did possess some specks of green. Danny figured he should observe her, lest his ectoplasm did something nasty to everyone involved. You feeling alright? The Hafa asked as Yanagi pushed the giant ball forward with her telekinesis. It's nothing out of ordinary, the girl responded. You just need to get the hang of it, Kendo gave a thumbs up. She does, right. The redhead turned to the Hafa. Well Danny hummed. Human bodies have some limits. Yanagi sends are admittedly bigger, he said and turned to the girl in question. If you feel burning or chills that come from within, don't hesitate to use your quirk. Ectoplasm needs release or it starts piling up and eating organic matter. My charge lets you grasp more residual energies and expose yourself to larger amounts of those. But in our line of work this shouldn't be an issue at all. You'll come to use it a lot, after all. Yanagi blinked. I didn't know there were such downsides. I can take it any time if it causes you any discomfort, Danny offered. Power doesn't come cheap. My heart doesn't beat, for one. At this, he received a couple of concerned glances. Yeah, yeah, I'm an actual ghost, he sarcastically stated the truth. Don't worry, I promise you'll be fine. Someone is a master of comforting, Kendo responded sarcastically. It's better than not knowing, Yanagi said. Thank you for the warning. I'll keep this in mind. And finally, the time for recreation was over. Danny himself situated at the special seat alongside his classmates, a bag of popcorn in his hands. He could as well enjoy it while watching. During the time off Cementus created a fighting arena with his quirk, a spacious rectangular one. All right, everyone, present Mike shouted in excitement. Here it comes, the finals you've all been waiting for are starting. Match number one, Hitoshi Shinso vs Midoriya Izuku. Even though he's done well, what's with that face? The announcer commented on the photo of the anxious green-haired teen. Well, no matter, the rules of this round are simple. Force your opponent out of bounds or immobilize them. You can also win by making your opponent say I give up. Bring on the injuries, for our own recovery girl is waiting on the standby. Put your morals and ethics aside for a moment. But of course, everything life-threatening is crap. 
It's not allowed. Heroes must use their fists only to capture villains. I'll stop them if things go too far, said Cementos, who sat on a cement chair and assumed the position of a ref. All right, now, start. The fight did not begin immediately. Shinso was hardly a loudmouth, so his and Midoriya's conversation couldn't be properly heard over the noises around. However, whatever the indigo-haired teen said, it must have infuriated the usually non-confrontational student. It did surprise the half-ghost to observe this, but even more so what followed next. After making just a few steps, Midoriya froze in spot, and Ajiro jumped from his seat not so far from Danny and yelled, No, I went through all the trouble of warning him, too, he exclaimed, grabbing his head. The rest of his classmates were at the edge of their seats as well. Hey, hey, what's the matter? Asked present Mike. This is an important first match. Live things up. Midoriya, the match just started and he is completely frozen. He isn't moving a muscle. Is this Shinso's quirk? He didn't stand out at all and yet it is something so amazing. What's going on? Asked Yuraraka. Blank look, lack of hostility dot 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 yep. Signs are all there, Danny mumbled. So, mind control it is, Shinso. He asked nobody in particular. What? The classmates turned to him. This does make sense, mumbled Yeyurazu. Is there a way to fight it? She asked this, as Shinso issued his simple command to Midoriya to walk out of bounds on his own. I have no idea, responded Phantom. I'm not brainwashing anyone, I take over bodies. But if it's anything like my overshadowing enough willpower must snap him out of his trance. But to do that his mind must be awake, Kiro, commented Sue. We don't know that. I think a jolt should work as well, answered Ajiro. I told this to Midoriya but I snapped out of trance after I accidentally ran into someone. But there's nobody who can do that to Midoriya, he said worriedly. Everyone remained tense. They saw how Midoriya was walking towards his seemingly imminent defeat. But then, when he was close to the edge, something happened, and to Danny's own shock, a gust of air escaped his mouth. What the? The next second a powerful shockwave emerged from where Midoriya stood, strong enough for everyone to feel the air blowing into their faces. And when the dust settled, Midoriya was still standing at the edge, still not out of bounds, and most importantly free of Shinso's control. Midoriya's has stopped. Present Mike exclaimed over the noise of the elated crowd. Midoriya, exclaimed Ada with relief. I'm, and so glad, Yuraraka breathed out. Danny rose from his seat and approached the railing, his eyes piercing into the green-haired teen. Nobody expected such a lively reaction. But the interest of his was not only due to Midoriya's trick, which left two of his fingers wounded and swollen. Phantom's ghost sense had been triggered, and its source was located exactly where Midoriya stood. It disappeared as quickly as it had come which made the Hafa all the more confused. And besides, he sensed not one, but many traces that showed up for a fraction of a second. Powerful ones, which couldn't belong to someone with ectoplasm using quirk. But if they came, then where were they now? Something wasn't right. But his shock at the underline of Midoriya's unexpected comeback remained largely unnoticed. Everyone was too focused on the match. What did you do? Shinso demanded to know. Midoriya stopped himself from responding by putting a palm over his mouth. Why won't he answer? Asked Kirishima. Because he finally remembered. Ajiro released a relieved sigh. I had a theory that Shinso's quirk activates when someone answers him. That was quite convenient. Just saying nothing could easily negate Shinso's power. However, Kirishima saw that his friend was very distressed. Is everything all right, Fenton? I just sense never mind, Danny responded. He knew that nobody but him believed in ghosts. It was pointless, and he didn't really know what was going on. In the meantime, Midoriya started approaching Shinso once more. He ran forward, before finally ramming into the general studies student, ignoring the provocative shouts of the latter. Grabbing Shinso, Midoriya started pushing him back, clearly being the stronger one despite the size difference. Say something, Shinso exclaimed and punched Midoriya in the face, leaving a bloodied nose. But his opponent was unrelenting, so Shinso changed the tactic. He hit Midoriya into his already wounded hand, breaking out of the grip, getting behind the enemy and now attempting to push Midoriya out first. But in the end, the student of Wana seized the rival once more and followed it with a shoulder toss and slammed Shinso out of bounds. The audience exploded into cheers of excitement, and it was no different for 1A. Danny let himself snap out of his thoughts and let out a cheer of his own. That was so manly, Hiroshima said. I think I'll go congratulate him in person, added Danny and turned to leave. But he will be coming here soon. I'm quite impatient. He needed to know for sure. That energy amount clearly did not belong to a human. Danny knew where to go. Midoriya may have won, but his fingers were damaged after the boy used his quirk. That story had some missing pieces, so Danny went to the hospital to shed some light onto it. His match wasn't coming anytime soon, 
In any case, as the Hafa traversed the corridors and rounded a corner, he accidentally bumped into a frail blonde man wearing a suit. Ouch, sorry, Danny rubbed his forehead, before looking the surprised-looking man over and blinking. Whom are you from UA? Staff? WH what makes you think so? The man chuckled nervously. This is a restricted area, no? Asked Danny. All right, you got me, I do work here. But I needed to go to a hospital. The Hafa tilted his head. For what? Why did young Fenton have to be nosy then all of a sudden? I have a headache, young child. Nothing serious. I was just heading there, too. We can go together, sir. Tashinori gulped. That certainly complicated the matters. And he couldn't just say no. All hopes were on recovery girl understanding the predicament. The two of them made it to the hospital wing, where the entrance was decorated with girly stickers. Tashinori always found her inner childishness amusing. He also was the one who walked in first, earning the reaction from Midoriya, who had his fingers and upper palm wrapped in bandages. Oh, and then Midoriya noticed Danny peeking in before he had the time to finish the sentence. Hey, pal, congrats on your win, the half a smirked. Hello to you too, old lady. As impertinent as the last time, recovery girl grumbled. What last time? Asked Midoriya. He still refuses to go through half of the checkups, the short old woman grumbled. Force of habit, Danny shrugged. You'll get my weapon grade blood over my fully dead body. Toshinori coughed slightly, about to say something of his own, but the half a noticed this and beat him to it. Oh, right. This guy needs some medicine for his headache. Midoriya could see the discomfort, and All Might would not have come without a reason. Yet, he couldn't reveal himself in front of the half a, so he had to go. An excuse was needed. Boom, thank you for coming, Fenton Sam. I'll join you guys up there soon. Surprisingly, a smile on Danny's face wavered, and he turned more serious. I was also curious, he said and leaned against the wall. What you did out there was pretty odd. You haven't seen anything by any chance. Or anyone. Midoriya's face was a strange mix between shock, curiosity and fright at how Danny pinpointed what happened so precisely. H how did you know that? He asked, and All Might tensed up as well. They both had a question in their mind. Did he know about the quirk? It's a speculation, Danny scratched his chin. You know I can sense ectoplasmic energies. When you used your quirk, I felt it. That's odd, because up until now I got nothing when you used it. And at such a scale, too. You'll think I'm crazy, but did you see someone else in that arena? Someone who did not appear human. Do you mean that someone else was there? Asked recovery girl in shock. I don't know, that's why I'm asking. I never felt this much energy from a human, so I suspected something else. Danny's look turned even more serious. You clearly saw someone, Midoriya, didn't you? I didn't. The human teen lied through his teeth. Midoriya panicked. He suspected what those beings were, but Danny didn't need to know that. He was getting awfully close to his and All Might's most important secret. It's nothing serious, Fenton Sam. Danny stared at Midoriya for some time, before sighing. I'm just worried, is all. I know that this much ectoplasm can kill a normal human. And if it's not someone from the outside but your own quirk dot 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 you catch the memo. I'm fine, Fenton San, the teen reassured. I promise. Danny nodded, but on the inside he was still torn. Midoriya looked fine enough, so his quirk must have allowed him to handle that much ectoplasm. Maybe he was worried for nothing. But why did he feel a surge of energy only now? Midoriya didn't look like he himself knew what it was all about, so the half it chose not to press yet. Maybe Midoriya's quirk simply had more layers to it than he had thought. If you say so, Danny mumbled. People who know of ectoplasm rarely understand how dangerous that thing is. More so than beings that are comprised of it. If something weird happens, like you starting to see things or feeling like you are twisted inside out, just ring me up. I told this to Yanagi-san already, but I can always remove the excess, he said with good intentions in heart. Unfortunately, All Might gained a new fear at that very moment. He got reminded that it was within Phantom's power to reach his hand and take the torch that had been passed from generation to generation. From behind Danny's back the blonde motioned that the discussion had to end. But luckily, it was Danny that deemed the talk over. Anyways, we're waiting for you up there, Danny smirked and turned to leave. Again, congrats on your win. He gave a thumbs up and left. All Might released a sigh. That was awfully close, he commented. Now that we are alone young Midoriya, did you tell him the truth? No, Midoriya shook his head, staring at the door. In reality, his guess was scarily on point. So you saw something? The teen nodded. There were silhouettes of eight or nine people, I'm not sure. You were there, too. Young Fenton appeared confident that you were seeing. Ghosts, Midoriya finished. But you are still alive, so it can't be right. But do you think that I was seeing the people who had inherited one for all? All Might appeared shaken. 
All of this is scary stuff. I also saw something like this before in my younger days. It's a clear sign you got a better grasp on one for all. I think it's like a trace of something they left behind in one for all. It's not something with intent that can interfere with you, nor can you interfere with them. But Fenton San clearly noticed their presence, too. I'm confused. Midoriya scratched his temple. All Might's look turned serious. Young Midoriya, you must also realize the threat young Fenton may pose even if not intentionally. What do you mean? Midoriya's eyes went wide. Fenton San is a good friend and class representative. Yes, but you heard and saw him. He is fully capable of taking one for all. He said that it works only with quirks that use ectoplasmic and or a look of realization crossed the boy's features, which he just confirmed that you may have, even if indirectly. Young Midoriya, I don't believe young Fenton to be a dark force waiting to strike. But nobody else must be allowed to take hold of something as powerful as one for all. Be it a copy or unintentional passing, you have to understand. And if you get high enough in today's ranks, there's no doubt you'll have to face him. And there's no guarantee that he will be conscious of the consequences and doesn't decide to take. All Might didn't finish his sentence, because he was hit by a syringe lookalike cane of the local nurse. Since when is number one hero this paranoid? Recovery girl asked. I'll be more worried about Fenton's own well-being. What do you mean, recovery girl? Asked Midoriya. I already told you that he missed half of the checkups. But from what I already gathered dot 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 he shouldn't be alive by any logic. Both visitors stared at her, making the old woman sigh. Quirks always manifest themselves logically. Quirk factors adapt the whole body, change it so that it can fulfill the purpose. Some are born with quirks that wound and cripple them. Fentons should by all logical sense kill him. His bones and muscles are not fit for super strength. His eyes and hands are not built to fire lasers. His whole body cannot logically withstand low temperatures with ease. And yet he does all that and more. He lacks a heartbeat, and I don't even know how he breathes. I really wanted to check his quirk factor, but he refuses to let me. Same went for his blood. That's even scarier, All Might shivered. So you are saying that taking one for all may actually kill him? Well, yes and no. On one hand, he seems to be doing fine even without a heart. Somehow, I'm not going to cut him open to find out. But on the other, we never know what can be a final nail. All of those are simply theories. Midori aside and got up from his seat. I'll make sure he doesn't take one for all, intentionally or not. But I know that Danny doesn't want to do anything bad to anyone. We all know. I just knew someone who wasn't as amicable. All Might mumbled solemnly. And I'm afraid that he won't pull the brakes when it is much needed and will only end up harming himself and others. Well, off you go now. The tournament is just starting. A small cloud was released around the man as his gargantuan form was displayed. I'm certain you will only show your best. He reassured his protege with his signature grin. Midoriya made his way to the seats of his class. Once he was there, he was immediately greeted by Yuroraka's joyful cheer. Hey, Deku. She called for him. We saved a seat for you, Ada added. Thank you, Midoriya smiled, before his look drifted to his other classmates. Ajiro gave him a smile and a thumbs up. Then the green-haired boy looked at another group, where Danny was lively chatting with Kirishima about something, not noticing the newest arrival. And after everything talked about in the nurse office, Danny's inconsiderate words back from back then flashed in the boy's mind. I know that this much ectoplasm can kill a normal human. How would you know it, Fenton Sam? Midoriya asked himself grimly, before sitting in his spot. All right. Present Mike's voice rang throughout the arena. Next on the line are, these guys. The giant screen showed the next pair, Todoroki versus Siro. All right, the commentator looked at the latter. He's good, but what's with the plainness he just can't get rid of? From the hero course, it's Siro Hanta. He gave his totally unbiased commentary. Versus, taking fourth, then second in the prelims, you are pretty strong, kid. He wasn't recommended for admission for nothing. Also from the hero course, Todoroki Shoto. And now, for the second round begin. Siro did not waste a second. He immediately released his tape forward, wrapping the fabric around Todoroki's body. And then he attempted to fling the opponent out of bounds. A surprise attack. Don't you think it was the best choice for the situation? Seriously, get him, Siro. And then, the previously silent Todoroki's feet touched the ground. And immediately ice emerged from beneath his legs, a lot of ice. The overwhelming amount in but a split second grew in size that was previously deemed incomprehensible. With a powerful earthquake that shook the arena, Todoroki's entire power went into creating a glacier that was the size of several cruise ships piled together. It went up and up, higher than the stadium itself. Danny was more than impressed at that display, tapping on the ice that reached his very own front seat. Don't you think it was too much? Asked fully frozen Siro with cluttering teeth. 
Half frozen midnight did not look amused. Siro kun, can you move? Oh, of course not. Todoroki advances to the second round. Midnight announced, apologies for the lengthy wait. We had to wait until the ice was removed. Present Mike spoke. On to the next match. And as he said it, Danny made his way to the arena. The moment of reckoning made his core flutter in excitement. Something which could not be said about Kaminari. First comes the undisputed leader of the prelims from Class 1A. The one who scored higher than All Might during the entrance exam. Fenton Daniel from 1A. Awe and blushing, Danny mumbled, hiding his embarrassment. Higher than All Might. A collective murmur traveled around the shocked audience and the viewer base. And an elated laughter sounded in an underground lap. Against him sparking killing boy, Kaminari from Class 1A. Kaminari heard a stifled laugh coming from his opponent. Now, let's have a flashy battle just like the last one. Present Mike shouted. Kaminari was scared, that much was obvious, for Fenton's malicious grin did not go anywhere. He had only one chance at salvation he had to strike immediately. Indiscriminate shock, 1.3 million bolts. He exclaimed as the sparks of electricity danced around him. Phantom knew what was coming, but that time there was a major difference. His still ice blue eyes were focused on his opponent. The next moment a powerful charge of electricity was released, but the Hafa lazily waved his palm and conjured a dome over himself. Kaminari, who was slowly getting his brain fried by the very electricity who was using, and the audience as well observed how under the dome Danny conjured himself a glowing green chair as well, sitting on it with a smug grin and waiting until the electric storm was over. Kaminari was helpless to stop his attack. And soon after, the braindid teen could only stand in place with a vacant expression, drooling. Danny's smirk did not go anywhere as he removed the shield, standing up. You shouldn't let the scare make you fire without thinking. He lectured, knowing full well that Kaminari was in no state to heed the advice. And then his eyes glowed green. The battle has been decided so quickly. Present Mike exclaimed, in just an instant. Wait, what's he doing with that chair oof? That's gotta hurt. That was a bit harsh, don't you think? Hiroshima asked his friend. Danny raised an eyebrow and glanced at the empty seat Kaminari used to occupy. The rest of their classmates followed suit. You think? Danny asked and took a sip out of a water bottle. He will be all right. You know I could do worse. I'm pretty sure you broke some of his bones with that chair, Cyril pointed out. Did he even feel it, though? Asked Danny, you know, with his mind fried and all. That's an interesting question. Midoriya mumbled as he wrote something in his journal. We must not forget what the last two matches taught us. Eater raised his hand. The damage dealt during the fights may turn out to be more grave than we expect. I just hit him with a chair, Danny moaned. You have super strength, Fenton, Gyro reminded him dryly. Ida-san, isn't your match the next one? Oh, you are right. Ida exclaimed in horror and bolted under some good-natured laughs from his classmates. Who is he fighting against, again? Asked Kirishima. Mehatsum, responded Danny. We haven't seen her use her quirk yet, Midoriya said. Because it's useless in a fight, Danny was quick to clear the confusion. It grants her an eyesight strong enough to see several miles ahead. That's why I didn't warn Ida. Didn't see the need. You probably have all seen that it's not her quirk you should be wary about. It's her gadgets, the green-haired student realized. How do you know of this? Our shared passion for tool creation makes us meet pretty often, Danny said dramatically. We occasionally talk. Talk how exactly? Asked Maitu with an expression that obviously hinted at his obscene thoughts. It's mostly just sharing of knowledge, answered Phantom without batting an eye. Although I don't teach the use of ectoplasm in engineering. I'll probably get punished for that. By whom? Mina tilted her head. Some very annoying guys with too much power. They're already angry enough with me as it is. Everyone blinked. What have you done to upset them? Midoriya asked. Well, one, I am still alive, despite their best wishes. And two dot 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 this will stay between us, I think. They still couldn't deal with the fact that the infinite realms needed a glorified conduit in the form of a monarch. With the previous royal gone, there was only one viable candidate. One who had enough support among the closest lords to append the observance hold over the dead world. They viewed him as a threat, while still not forgetting how Phantom had made a fool out of them, making the world question if their gift of foresight was as impeccable as everyone had believed. But, at some point, an unspoken agreement was reached. Danny, after all, was not eager to ascend from the title of a prince, content with the rank he already had. Danny's mind drifted off to the idea that they could actually let him into the treasury had they not been such pricks. It would have saved him plenty of troubles. Nonetheless, the next match was upon them. An interesting incident took place prior to that, as Ida surprised everyone by actually putting on the support equipment. Problem was, the hero course had to inform the organizers about their gear prior to the tournament. 
hence Danny had gone without his tools. However, Ida was allowed to wear the strange contraption on his back. It turned out that May was the one to provide him with tools to keep things fair. That's bull, Danny commented upon hearing this. For someone like her to let go of her advantage, do you think she has an ulterior motive? Asked Midoriya with concern. She's in to advertise her skills and gear. She told me this much, Phantom recalled. Or what? You thought she's dying to be in the hero course. I haven't thought about this, the boy mumbled. So, this fight is to let her show as much as she can. Yep, but taking the gear from her was stupid. Who knows what she snuck into those. And the half-ghost's prediction was not far from wrong. The following match was dot 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 the longest so far. The cause of this was not due to the equilibrium between the two contestants. Rather, the match owed its length to the absolute control May had over her opponent. The whole fight immediately turned into a long presentation of everything she had crafted and had brought along, be it the electromagnetic boots, or a capture net, or a plethora of other tools to help her evade each and every attack of the bespectacled hero trainee, who was also aided by the very tools May had granted him. To her credit, the backpack and its auto-balancers were not rigged in any way. However, with Ida using them for the first time, he could appear clumsy, unable to get a hold of the pink-haired girl. Most of his classmates pitied Ida, while Beck Hugo was roaring with laughter. Danny shared the former sentiment mostly, but he was intrigued by some tools he hadn't seen May make. For instance, that net she used to capture Ida. If laced with ectoplasm, those nets that were tightly packed into a handgun-sized contraption could be a useful anti-ghost weapon he was thinking like his father. Danny caught Kirishima's look. What? You are rambling, dude. About ghosts, the redhead responded dryly, to which Danny laughed nervously and rubbed the back of his neck. Kirishima never understood why would Fenton be so interested in making tools so situational and specifically dangerous to him. The audience was getting extremely tired from the presentation aimed only at a specific group of people. It felt obvious to many as to who was going to win. May, however, did something unexpected. For when all of her gadgets were seen by possible employers from support companies, she simply stepped out of bounds. And that meant that the winner was the very person she had been making a fool out of. Needless to say, Ida remained unsatisfied with such cheap victory, but there was no going back. With one more round behind them, without further ado, the next match came about. And it was something Danny was most curious about. It was, in the essence, an experiment on how well Yanagi's body would fare with all the extra power given to her. Not that Danny had had such intentions initially, but now he had to go through with it. If something happened, he would be there to resolve everything. But of course, he also prayed that he would not have to intervene. It was an uncharted territory, humans that used ectoplasm and who were still fully alive. Coming from the family of Ecto researchers, he wanted to know more. That interest was born when he first saw Kirajiri. All right, everyone, present Mike spoke up again. The next one promises to be as interesting as all the rest. First from the hero course, Class 1A, Ashido Mina. Is something going to come out of these horns? I suppose we'll see. And the second, Class 1B of the hero course as well. Yanagi Ryaiko, to whom we owe the spectacular show of two-person army of the last match. Yanagi looked at the ground when present Mike presented her in such a manner. After all it wasn't entirely her doing, was it? The girl looked first at Kendo, who was at their own class row, and then at the half-ghost, who gave her an encouraging smile. That did not go unnoticed by Kirishima. Who exactly are you rooting for here, Fenton? He asked with mock suspicion. Both are good. Mean is my friend, but I feel a certain ectoplasmic bond. That and I hope my little boon will actually be useful. Right, you augmented her quirk, didn't you, Fenton Sam? Midoriya asked excitedly, waiting to scribble everything down. Yep, before that she could only lift smaller objects. With my help dot 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 well, you saw it too. As long as she doesn't overextend and waste the energy I left with her, this power boost will stay where it is. Meanwhile, back with the contestants, Mina was grinning from ear to ear. So, you got along with Danny Kun back there, she commented slowly. Inagi rewarded her with an ever emotionless look. We made a good team, she responded, glancing at her hanging arms and feeling the energy course through her. Heh, sure you did, the girl winked, before clapping her hands and splashing gooey acid around. And once Midnight gave the much-expected signal, Mina lunged forward towards her opponent. She realized her vulnerability. A single flick of a palm could ruin it all. So once more, all money were bet on the speed and instant action. She secreted the acid on her path, allowing her to quickly slide forward. Yanagi concentrated her power and moved her palm to meet the approaching pink girl. But Mina instantly tossed the acid her way. Yanagi's attention turned to defending herself as Mina splashed more and more liquid. 
The poltergeist girl could do little but use her telekinesis to keep the acid away from herself. Yanagi took a breath and an idea occurred in her head. As Mina circled around, looking for an opening to lunge into her opponent and push her out of bounds, she made sure to secrete more acid. In the scenario most favorable to Mina, Yanagi would turn her back on the pink hero trainee. Mina could only guess that the stark-haired girl needed eye contact, or at least the knowledge of the object's position in order to grab it. Otherwise Yanagi would not be turning around to keep Mina in her sight. So, if she only managed to get behind, and an observant viewer would see that the acid Mina was throwing was not melting the ground, glimmering with purple and green light close to it. As Mina went for another strike, Yanagi suddenly raised her palms, and all the acid in her hold came together to form a single shield that absorbed the strike. Well, present Mike exclaimed, would you look at this, that acid cannot melt itself, which makes it a perfect protection. Nice thinking, Yanagi. Now Yanagi could take a breather and collect her thoughts, protected by a dome-like shield. Mina was hesitant to come closer, unsure about how well she would end up on another end. Firing more acid only reinforced the improvised barrier, and Yanagi had enough juice to keep it up. And now she could concentrate on the opponent. Watchful so as not to wound Midnight or Cementos, naive and misplace those fears as they might have been, Yanagi launched all the acid at her disposal forward, in the form of smaller droplets, flung with the tenacity of a machine gun. Careful out there, Ashido, warned present Mike, stopping at this time will be a sentence. You think I don't know that? Mina complained quietly, dodging the barrage and sliding across the ground. Mina is resistant to her acid, no. Won't this attack be pointless? Siro asked his classmates. It has own limits, though. Midoriya was quick to respond, opening his battered journal. The more she produces, the less resistant her skin is. And she's made plenty. Does Yanagi know of this weakness? Asked Kirishima, before all eyes turned to Phantom, whose mouth was full with popcorn. It wasn't me, he said and gulped it down. Come on, even if Mina is resistant, being hit by droplets at such speed is gonna hurt. Yanaga's improvised armaments were close to depleting, but now she had Mina right where she needed it far away from herself and closer to the edge. The room for reaction turned too small. Yanagi finally tossed the remaining acidic goo away and raised both arms. Mina felt how her body betrayed her, refusing to move as the familiar purple-greenish glow surrounded her. And then, a small push, and with a loud yelp the pink-skinned girl flew out of bounds, under the ever-excited cheers of the crowd, and especially the classmates of the winner. Now I do feel like this is all my fault, Danny mumbled. It kinda is, though, Kirishima agreed. You gave her the trademark Opus Fenton juice. I want to punch you just for naming it like this, the half a deadpan, his shoulders sinking. And speaking of, present Mike decided to rub salt in the wound. That was a quick, yet outstanding display. The half a banged his head on the metal railing. Please don't hate me, Mina. Please don't hate me, Yanagi, he mumbled. That was unnecessary, said Takoyami, crossing his hands. It was Yanagi's own skill that let her withstand the initial attack and win. Yeah, it's her quirk and power now. I hope I didn't screw it over for both of them. The aforementioned railing broke under the teen's forehead. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 7. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author Ruse Emp on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.